Thank you very much. The next item of business is the continuation of the debate on the Scottish Government's Programme for Government 2017-2018. I would invite members who wish to speak this afternoon to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Shona Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, our programme for government sets out an ambition of ensuring our public services meet the changing needs of the people of Scotland, not least our ambitions for the delivery of high quality health and care services for all. Our guiding principles are that we believe in creating a Scotland where people live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting where services are integrated around the needs of the individual and focus on prevention, early intervention and self-management and where everyone can get the services they need. To help meet these principles, we published in December the Health and Social Care Delivery Plan, setting the priorities for action throughout this Parliament. At heart of our approach is one of investment and reform to meet the challenges that face our health and care services. And we build upon a strong legacy, a record high 90% of Scottish inpatients say overall care and treatment was good or excellent. Our A&E services are the best performing in the UK. Continuing and increasing investment is vital, building on our record levels of spend, will ensure that the health revenue budget increases by £2 billion by the end of this Parliament. Within this, there must be reform as well, a deliberate shift in the balance of care. We will increase the share of frontline NHS investment towards our community health services of primary and social care, as of course called for by opposition parties in this Parliament. Bluntly though, this shift will not be easy, but it is necessary for the future. A stronger community health sector will give more timely support to people and ultimately re relieve some of the pressures on our hospitals. But we need to ensure that performance continues to be supported. For that reason, we're investing in better services to meet rising demand. That's why for elective care, we're investing £200 million to expand the Golden Jubilee and establish five NHS elective care centres. Equally, we need to invest in those principles we most value. Having examined the merits and challenges of extending free personal care for those under 65, then we will take forward Frank's law as the First Minister announced. And I want to pay particular tribute to Amanda Copel, who I visited this morning, and those who have campaigned on this important issue. As a result, up to 9,000 people currently receiving personal care will no longer be liable for charges for the personal care they receive once this policy is implemented. And I know this policy has support across this chamber and I hope we can continue to count on that support from all sides as we seek to ensure that the UK government does not claw back any benefits from people as a result of this extension of free personal care. We will build on our strong and capable workforce over this parliament. We're well on our way to putting in place 250 community link workers and practices serving our poorest populations and training 1,000 uh, paramedics and ensuring that all GP practices have access to a pharmacist. To build capacity for mental health care, we'll deliver an extra 800 professionals to expand support. We'll strengthen the quality of services introducing a safe staffing bill to enshrine safe health and care staffing in law, starting with nursing and midwifery. And we'll continue to take forward national workforce planning. Following publication of the national plan for NHS staff this June, we are working with stakeholders to publish plans for the social care workforce and for primary care staff, including GPs. Above all, we need to invest in the workforce, the heart of our health and care services, the First Minister announced on Monday that we'll lift the 1% public sector pay cap. Our nurses and public sector workers deserve a pay rise. But of course, investment alone is not enough. Our services need to change to meet the changing uh, needs of health and care uh, within uh, the Scottish population. And that's reflected in our bold approach to mental health services. In March, we published our 10-year mental health strategy. To back our vision of a Scotland where people get the right help at the right time will improve support for children and young people. For example, in the coming months, we'll start a national review of personal and social education and the role of pastoral guidance in schools. We'll also improve transition from children and adolescent services to adult mental health services. And of course, we've uh, announced our investment uh, in alcohol and drugs uh, in the, a key area of public health. Yes, of course. Ian Gray. 
of my constituents, and I think this is probably true of everyone in the chamber, are waiting 30, 40 weeks for access to therapies such as talking therapies and mental health. The minister cannot surely believe that this is acceptable. That's why we've published the new mental health strategy and we're seeing a huge investment in the workforce which is growing uh, and of course that's why uh, we are investing in that workforce to make sure that we can reduce the amount of time people are waiting whether that's for acute services for those who need it but also within the field of primary care the vision for the new multidisciplinary team with the new GP contract at its heart is absolutely about making sure that when someone goes to their GP, for example, that they're able to be signposted then and there to the right professional, whether that's a mental health worker or someone else. And that's what the new multidisciplinary team will be based around. We'll also take action, as I was just saying, around public health, such as drugs and alcohol. And as, as of course, was announced in the programme for government, an additional £20 million annually for alcohol and drug services. And of course, making the links to mental health, because we know that often mental health and addiction issues are combined very briefly. Neil Findlay. The Minister could say out what the reductions have been in the drug and al alcohol budget in the previous years. Well, of course, we asked health boards to maintain the spend on alcohol and drug services and, of course, the performance in terms of the waiting time targets for alcohol and drug services have continued to be met. However, in recognition of the need for more preventive work, the £20 million actually goes further than the £15 million that Neil Finlay was, uh, was referring to. So I would hope that Neil Finlay could perhaps bring himself to welcome the additional £5 million that's now going to be going in annually to alcohol and drugs services, because that will make a real difference on the ground. And of course, other public health issues are highlighted in the programme for government, such as diet and obesity. We'll be limiting, uh, limit the marketing of products high in fat, sugar or salt, and we'll consult on a new diet and obesity strategy to explore what more we can do. Radical action to tackle some of the big public health challenges. I've spoken at length uh, about health, but only to illustrate what is uh, true in our approach to all public services, that Scotland deserves services that improve and deliver. And these are the principles that are enshrined in our programme for government. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we now have Miles Briggs to be followed by Claire Hockey. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by welcoming the announcement on Tuesday by the First Minister that the Scottish Government has at long last agreed to implement Frank's Law and deliver free personal care for Scots under the age of 65. And I want to pay tribute to the One Woman campaign that is Amanda Capel, who during the time I've sought to bring forward my Frank's Law Private Members Bill has become not only a good friend, but quite frankly, an inspiration to me and I know so many across this chamber. Having spoken with Amanda on Tuesday, I know how grateful she is for the support she's received. And I have to put on record um, her thanks and my thanks to the Dundee Courier newspaper, particularly their former political editor, Kieran Andrews, who supported Amanda from the outset in campaigning for this most important change. And I think it's only right and important that I also take this opportunity to thank the Parliament's non-governmental bills team for the help and advice which they've provided me as I've sought to progress my Members' Bill in Parliament. As Ruth Davidson said on Tuesday, if the First Minister and the Scottish Government wishes to get Frank's Law in and working on the ground as soon as possible, they'll have the support of these benches and I believe the whole Chamber. But let me be clear to the Government benches. For too many people in Scotland, Frank's Law is needed today. It was needed yesterday, and we need to see this action from the Scottish Government to deliver this policy at the earliest opportunity. Presiding Officer, it is more than 10 years now since this SNP Government took full charge of Scotland's NHS, and therefore I believe an appropriate moment to assess their record of more than a decade now running our health services in Scotland. And a legitimate place to start that assessment, I believe, is the SNP's 2007 manifesto. I'm sorry to say something which is littered with broken promises. Targets pledged in 2007 for waiting times from referral to treatment and for cancer patients have been consistently missed. An NHS redress bill has failed to materialise. A promised reduction in antidepressants has instead seen antidepressant use soar. A pledge to ring fence mental health funding for health boards and local authorities has been abandoned. Health checks for all men and women when they reach the age of 40 discontinued. The list goes on. And any similar analysis of the SNP's 2011 and 16 manifestos reveal a further catalogue of letdowns. 
But not only have they failed to deliver many of their own manifesto pledges for improvement, this summer has seen confirmation from a wide range of indicators that show that our health service is moving backwards under this failed SNP government. In the past year alone, the A&E waiting times target has been met just six out of 52 weeks. The 18-week referral for treatment targets hasn't been met for more than three years. Waiting times for vital diagnostic tests are increasing. More than one in 10 cancer patients are waiting too long for treatment. Outpatient waiting times are growing, and the number of outpatients waiting longer than a year for, patient, for treatment has jumped by more than 400% in the space of just one year. Performance is in seeing inpatients in day cases is, is, is deteriorating, and five out of six targets for stroke patients are now being missed. In addition, no, I want to make some progress, thank you. In addition, over a quarter of adults are waiting too long for psychological, psychological therapies, as I've already been mentioned. And the list goes on. The government is set to miss its target for getting GP services online. Delayed discharge is still costing hundreds of thousands of lost day beds. And the proportion of significant and high-risk backlog maintenance in our NHS estate has increased under this government. And at the heart of so many of these problems we are seeing across our health service is the sad reality that we have a worsening and severe NHS workforce crisis. One that the Scottish Government has had warnings about for years, but a government that took more than a decade to publish an NHS workforce plan. Decisions made by SNP ministers during their time in office have exacerbated the workforce crisis, and I think they need to have the humility to accept this. It was Nicola Sturgeon as Health Secretary who made the very poor decision in 2012 to cut the number of student nurse placements, arguing at the time that the cuts were a sensible way forward. When the RCN was warning the First Minister at the time that the move was not sustainable and would impact on patient care. More recently, in the 2016 budget, the SNP cut funding for alcohol and drug partnerships by £15 million. And as Neil Finlay has already raised, I think it was therefore a bit ironic for all members of this parliament to hear the First Minister announce on Tuesday funding for alcohol and drug services when it is her government who have put these very services in such a difficult position over the last year. Presiding officer, Scottish Conservatives recognise that there's an ever-increasing demand for health services in Scotland, that we face significant demographic challenges, and at the same time we need to shift the NHS to invest in prevention, innovation and community services. In the run-up to the 2021 20, election, we will continue to expose this government's ever-growing record of failure on our NHS, but we will also work with NHS staff and health experts to offer positive alternatives that will offer a new approach and one that we will ask the people of Scotland to endorse in 2021. Thank you. I call Clare Hockey to be followed by Ian Gray. Clare Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I refer members to my register of interests? The SNP governments over the past 10 years in office have consistently been champions of public services, and nowhere is this more evident than in our NHS where the Westminster Government has embarked on a hostile campaign of cuts and an enthusiastic opening up of services to private bidders. We have been fortunate in Scotland that our health service is devolved, allowing our government to follow a more productive, inclusive and person-centred approach than in the rest of the UK. Despite the restrictions of Barnet, this SNP Government has protected the frontline health budget and has used this money wisely. They have actually increased spending with the annual health resource budget up 40% from 2006 to £3.6 billion today. And at the end of this parliament, we will have seen increased health funding by almost £2 billion on top of the £3.3 billion already delivered by the SNP. We're investing £116 more per head than the UK government on health and continue to invest in our primary care and community services. And since 2007, the SNP government has increased staffing in the NHS with 12,000 more full-time equivalent staff than were in place when they took office in 2007. And staffing is projected to grow by another 1,400 1, more full-time equivalent staff in the coming year. If I can just make a little bit more progress, Mr Finlay. But this isn't just about putting more money and more people into the existing system and hoping for the best. We're building a health service fit for the challenges of the 21st century. One that will increasingly be about prevention and that looks to put the patient firmly 
at the centre of care. Scotland was the first country in the world to implement a national patient safety programme and hospital safety is continuing to improve. Figures published show that between January to March 2014 and January to March 2017, hospital mortality has fallen by 8.4%. This is a world leading programme. The integration of health and social care is just another example of how this government has revolutionised health service delivery. And while this integration is in its infancy, it is a model that has been look looked at by others, not only in the UK, but elsewhere. As the First Minister outlined on Tuesday, the Scottish Government will look to limit the marketing of foods high in fat, sugar or salt. And we need to work on the causes of ill health and diet and lifestyle because they're massive contributors to a whole range of health programmes, including diabetes, heart disease and cancer. In addition, this SNP government will imp implement a new soft opt-out scheme for organ donation, which will benefit many people each year who would otherwise not have had life-changing or life-saving transplants, where once families and friends would watch loved ones suffer and even die on a donor waiting list. Now those patients will have a chance at a new life. And this government will work to implement Frank's Law, implementing free personal care to those under 65 who require it. Presiding officer, I'm proud to say that our NHS will adapt to address wider issues around promoting health and well-being, tackling inequalities and supporting parity of importance between physical and mental health care. We recognise in Scotland that we need to have holistic systems to tackle problems that have multiple contributing factors. And because of this, the Scottish Government will, in every year of this Parliament, increase the share of the NHS budget being spent on mental health and on primary health community health and social care too. An additional £107 million for health and social care integration previously announced in January will ensure more people are able to be cared for in their homes instead of in hospitals. Presiding officer, at the Unison Scotland Nursing Conference last week, I heard the inspiring Nursing 2030 vision from the for the profession in Scotland from the Chief, Chief Nursing Officer Fiona McQueen. She spoke of a nursing service that increasingly will be about prevention, addressing issues around promoting wider health and well-being, tackling inequalities and supporting a parity of esteem between physical and mental health. And she outlined the future of nursing in Scotland, where it will continue to develop as a personalised, rights-based service embedded within a caring and compassionate professional relationship with individuals and communities. Nursing will continue to take into account wider physical, psychological, social, family and community life and nurses themselves will be prepared for increasingly technological environments. And in stark contrast to Westminster's treatment of nurses and the, the SNP government have maintained bursaries and free tuition for nursing and midwifery students. They've also ensured better pay and conditions for NHS Scotland staff as a whole, with entry pay in the NHS in Scotland £881 higher than England and over £1,300 higher than in Northern Ireland. Yes, Mr Rumbles. Mike Rumbles. With great care to, the, to members commenting on the National Health Service in Scotland, is it her view that everything is positive about the NHS in Scotland? Because so far I haven't detected any kind of criticism at all. Because if you represented people in the, in the North East from Grampian, they're not very content with the NHS. Claire Hockey. Uh, thank you. And I thank Mr Rumbles for, for his, uh, his intervention. Of course, the NHS is not perfect. I didn't say the NHS was perfect. However, we have to acknowledge the extraordinary work that our staff do and the service that they provide to our communities. And every time you make comments like that, I can tell you that hurts nurses and NHS staff. Yeah. And I warmly welcome the First Minister's announcement that the 1% public sector pay cap will be lifted. Band 5 nurses are between £225 and £309 a year better off here than those in England. And let's not forget NHS Scotland's policy of no compulsory redundancies. In stark contrast to England, where there have been 20,000 redundancies since 2010 alone. 20,000 redundancies. But the biggest threat to our NHS and public services is Brexit and its effects are already being felt before we've left the EU. 
Already, the Nursing and Midwifery Council reported that only 46 EU nurses registered to work in the UK in April this year, down 96% since July last year, when there were 1,304 applicants. This at a time when we need to recruit nurses. Presiding officer, I welcome and applaud the SNP government's consistent commitment to our NHS and to public health. It is a programme that builds on the world-leading healthcare we deliver in Scotland. It shows a commitment to funding and to evolving what healthcare means in Scotland. It recognises the value of the healthcare workforce and it places the patient at the centre of care where they should be. Thank you. I call on Ian Gray to be followed by James Dornan. Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. One thing the uh, programme for government tells us, I think, is that the widely held view that this government has achieved very little in 10 years is really beginning to hit home and to hurt. The First Minister has trawled campaign demands to concede necessities to make a virtue of and other parties' policies to lift all to pack into a programme designed to give the impression of frenetic activity. And all the while, of course, making sure she minimised any mention of the pursuit of independence, lest we are reminded that that is all the past 10 years have been about. Yes, I hear the groans because independence is again the purpose which dare not speak its name. And in all of this then, there was bound to be some things to welcome, low emission zones for example, Frank's law, lifting of the public sector pay cap, or raising the age of criminal responsibility. But when it came to the self-declared number one priority, improving education and closing the attainment gap, the most remarkable thing was that there was nothing new. Now, to be fair, the Education Secretary has already laid out his plans, and he has made clear that he intends to bulldoze them through, no matter what anyone says. We could have hoped that over the summer he might have listened to sense, changed course, but no. His own contribution to this debate on Tuesday made clear that everyone is out of step apart from John Swinney. Mr Swinney declared himself baffled at the conundrum, the contradiction, he said, of how anyone could want reform in schools yet oppose his reforms. They are simply the wrong reforms. Regional directors appointed by government, answerable to government, implementing a national framework developed by government, featuring standardised tests designed by government, delivered in schools whose budget has been decided centrally by government. And all of this overseen by a national education committee appointed and chaired by the education secretary himself. The real conundrum, presiding officer, is how on earth the education secretary expects anyone to believe that this is devolution and local autonomy. It is centralised command and control. But the biggest contradiction at the heart of this misguided reform agenda in education is when the First Minister says as she did. Her premise is a simple but powerful one. The best people to make decisions about a child's education are the people who know them best, their teachers and parents. She's right. And the decision of parents, teachers, head teachers, is that the government's reforms are wrong, misguided, damaging and unwanted. Educationalists agree with them. The government's own SNP colleagues in local government agree with them. And just as we went into recess, Mr Swinney's international education advisers specifically warned him against becoming too focused on changing the structure of the education system when arguably the more important aspects are the culture and capacity within the system. So not only do teachers, parents, educationalists and the international advisors agree the government is barking up the wrong tree, they also all agree on the real change needed. And that is more resource, more capacity and above all, more teachers. And no wonder, after 10 years of cuts to education, after all, this government has spent £1.25 billion less on education during its time in office than if it had simply maintained spending. It has 4,000 fewer teachers in schools than if it had simply maintained teacher numbers. 
and it is spending £491 less per head, per pupil, in real terms every year than in the budgets inherited when it came to power. Yet the programmes only new education funding is £1 million for school libraries. And that's welcome. But that amounts to around 50p per pupil per annum. It's not going to make up for £1.25 billion. Just as lifting the pay cap is not going to be enough for teachers who've seen their pay eroded by 16% in real terms. Only today... We see research from Bath University which shows that teachers in Scotland have working conditions which are considered extremely poor, that 40% of teachers in our schools are planning to leave the profession within the next 18 months. This government has taken our teachers for granted for far too long. The truth is that to make the reforms to education that we really need to restore teacher numbers, to make teachers' terms and conditions attractive enough to solve the recruitment crisis and stop those teachers leaving the profession, that would have required actual boldness and ambition on tax. The richest paying a little more. Instead, the First Minister says, she will have talks about talks about tax. Presiding officer, we had all this for nine years with the council tax. We had manifesto after manifesto making promises. We had cross-party commissions, cross-party consensus, but we've still got the council tax. It all turned out to be a smokescreen for a government who pretends to be progressive, but hides from hard decisions every single time. Yeah. Presiding officer, the First Minister said she was prepared to be controversial. If, by that, she means pursuing education reforms with no support, no evidence, no resources, and no prospect of improving outcomes, then I suppose that is controversial, in at least that it flies in the face of all common sense, all evidence, and all professional advice. But it is not what we need, and our children and grandchildren will pay the price. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. James Dornan, to follow by Liam Kerr. James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I've got things I want to say, but I, I don't. I think I would be. Uh, missing my duty if I didn't comment on the, the last two opposition speakers. Miles Briggs was, was quite happy to give a very specific uh, identification of, of issues he thinks are wrong with the government's record, but he uh, quite bluntly wouldn't take interventions from myself or my colleague John Mason because he knew we were going to ask him about his own party's record in charge of the UK health, the National Health Service, which is much, much worse than anything that's happening in Scotland. And remember, that's, that's the one that's in real crisis. A word that's used a lot over here and over there. Crisis in NHS, that's in England, that's not up here. Ian Gray, I could give the speech just on responses to Ian Gray's contribution. However, I do have a lot to say. What I will say is that, what, that to sum up Ian Gray's contribution was, let's not have any change to education, let's just throw more money at it. That was what you said. Presiding officer, spending time in the constituency over recess is one of my favourite aspects of being an MSP. And right up to these last two speeches, <laughs> uh, it was going to be a pleasure to return here to Holyrood. I've never been happier to be back in the thick of it all the same than after reading this SNP's programme for government. And it is a bold, exciting and visionary programme we have in front of us. And you can tell by the reaction of most of our opponents. And I even heard it there. This bit's good, but you stole it from us. The rest rubbish, not enough. How's it to be paid for? Why only now? Blah, blah, blah. Then we've got a comedy act of Ruth and Adam yesterday telling us we should be building seven new towns, thousands more houses a year than we already have in the pipeline, and we're meant to take them seriously. And folks, before there were a comedy act, they used to be magicians. Ruth was a magician, Adam was a glamorous assistant, of course. Their speciality was making council houses disappear. 
And man, they were good at that. The only problem being they never mastered the art of bringing them back or replacing them. And this looks like a belated attempt to make them reappear as if by magic, and of course, at no cost. Anyway, whilst we've been playing vaudeville halls up and down the country, this government's been getting on with the day job and how. A programme that consists of so much that I could spend another 10 minutes speaking about that. But I'll just go on to education. Signing officer, Parliament may not have been sitting in the, uh, over the summer and the schools may only just have returned. However, despite what we hear, Scotland's education sector has had much to cheer about over the last few months. And I do hope that everyone will join me in congratulating all pupils who sat exams this year, as well as thanking their teachers, staff and parents for the vital support that they provide. Scotland's teachers, as they always do, have gone the extra mile in ensuring our children and young adults leave school with great qualifications and that they are well equipped for progressing into higher education or entering the world of work. Of course, I'll take an intervention. Ian Gray. Mr Dornan's absolutely right. Our teachers have gone the extra mile. Does he understand that in return, they don't want his warm words, they want decent pay and conditions to do their job? James Dornan. Yes, OK, and uh, my committee just brought out a report on workforce planning. I am confident that there's many of the recommendations that workforce planning will be taken up. But if you can pretend that you can get this magic money tree, and I heard, I, I don't know how many promises or wishes uh, in your contribution there, then that would be, no, 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 that would, that would be very grateful. Uh, for the third year in a row, the number of higher passes gained by pupils surpassed 150,000 and a record number of Scottish pupils earned a university place on exam results day. These are achievements that I am sure the whole chamber can commend. And speaking of personal capacity, since the uh, SNP's electrical success in 2007, I'm very proud that we've been able to achieve so much and there can be no doubt that Scotland is in a better place now thanks to a decade of SNP governments. And I'll say something here, that what the problem that we have is that we forget just how dismal it was when we came into power in 2007. They were in such a state that they were giving money back to Westminster because they didn't know how to spend it. Today's programme for government is certainly the First Minister's most ambitious yet. And it's welcome that the major reforms to our education sector remain a real priority. The problem for government gives the First Minister and our Cabinet the opportunity to look forward, refocus their efforts and refresh their agenda. However, it's also an opportunity to build on the very strong foundations laid in the past. The government can be proud that free early learning and childcare has been increased from around 400 hours under Labour to 600 hours now, which will be almost doubled to 1140 hours by the end of this Parliament. We can be proud that 750 million will be invested through the Attainment Scotland Fund, which will drive forward improvements in educational outcomes in Scotland's most disadvantaged areas. We can be proud that it's rebuilt or refurbished 651 schools, over 250 more than under the previous administration. And we can be proud that tuition fees were scrapped. And not labour scrapped by merely shifting when the fees paid, but really scrapped, which can be saved students up to £27,000 compared with the cost of studying for a degree in England. Presiding officer, I regularly point out the doom and gloom espoused by the opposition parties in the last few days and the last few speeches have been no different. But I always find it incredulous and a wee bit sad and predictable when the Labour benches moan when we speak of teachers' numbers, just as Ian Gray's contribution did there, they act as if they're the only party to be trusted when it comes to education. However, recent events show once again that they could not be further from the truth. Local authorities have been responsible for sacking teachers and for classroom assistants. And if you want any evidence of that, they were in the door two minutes in North Lanarkshire, propped up by the Tories, I hasten to add, when they cut 198 teaching assistants. They then come greeting about the SNP and the Scottish Government. However, unfortunately for them, the electorate is not stupid. For the past 10 years, the SNP has been busy governing for the people of Scotland. I'm not really sure what Labour have been doing, besides holding countless leadership contests, of course. Presiding officer, make no mistake, as convener of the Education and Skills Committee, I know full well the challenges that lay ahead for the Scottish Government. However, I do have full trust in the Cabinet Secretary and the major reforms he's undertaking and that he will take the, the, the uh, recommendations of the committee into account. I was delighted to meet with him only last week at Hill Park Secondary School in my constituency to hear more about the Scottish Government's Teaching Makes People campaign, which is pushing for university undergraduates and people working in STEM industries to enter the teaching profession. Last week, as I said earlier, uh, the, my Education and Skills Committee released a report on teacher workforce planning after hearing an absolute mountain of evidence from teaching professionals who advised, among other things, that more must be done to attract our brightest and best to become teachers. And I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's view on a report once he's taken time to consider the recommendations. 
I welcome the announcement by the First Minister. Mr. John, Mr. John, it's time to work. It's seven minutes, please. Wind okay, up. right. Oh, do you want me to draw a conclusion? Okay. Just conclude, please. Yes, okay. I, I share the Scottish Government's ambition in creating a world class education system where everyone has the opportunity to succeed and the gap between our least and most advantaged children is closed. In my own view, nothing the Parliament or Government does will ever have greater importance. I look forward to getting back down to business with my committee and I have no doubt that this outstanding programme for government will make it more likely than not that our children will be able to reach the maximum of their potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. Liam Kerr to be followed by Sandra White. Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. There is an old joke cited since at least 1924 in which an Englishman asked an Irishman for directions. The payoff line is when the Irishman replies, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. Given the choice, I expect the Scottish Government in framing this programme wouldn't start from where 10 years of underachievement have put them. But they do, and I will examine the justice elements of this programme. Firstly, the commitment to crack down on drug driving. <laughs> Go ahead. Neil Findlay. I wonder if I could advise him, it's all in the delivery. Liam Kerr. Thank you. I look forward to delivering this speech. Thank you, Mr Findlay. Firstly, the commitment to crack down on drug driving, implementing specific driving limits for legal prescription drugs and an outright ban on illegal drugs. Good. This works and saves lives. Since 2015, 14,000 people have been convicted of drug driving south of the border, compared with 74 in Scotland. This is, of course, an initiative from the Scottish Conservatives, and I genuinely welcome that the Scottish Government has listened. We also welcome the move to extend the use of electronic monitoring of offenders in the community and enable the use of new technology where appropriate. Yes, Mr Matheson. Michael Matheson. Uh, I'm surprised that the member thinks that the issue around drug driving is a conservative uh, policy point. Uh, when we said that we would increase or we would decrease the drink driving rate in Scotland, we, would say, we said we then turn to the drug driving rate. That's exactly what we're doing. And once it's implemented, Scotland will have the most progressive and robust legislation for drink driving and for drug driving for any part of the UK. Exactly. Yeah. Which is precisely why I look to welcome it and precisely why Douglas Ross brought it up and the Scottish Government responded to it in February of this year. And what I was going to say was that I welcome the maturity in taking on our good ideas. I'm uh, delighted that Mr Matheson failed to abide by that. We cautiously welcome the bill to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12 and align it with the minimum age of prosecution. It would be churlish to point out this was a piece of legislation already announced by Mark MacDonald in December 2016. And indeed, over half the legislation proposed in this programme has been previously announced. Yet I am concerned. Why are the Scottish Government not standing up for victims? They could have taken this opportunity to introduce a genuine programme of restorative justice, to tip the balance back in favour of victims who too often experience a justice system that offers them nothing. And we also see no effort to ensure life means life for Scotland's most dangerous criminals. Under the current system, families of murder victims cannot rest easy knowing these criminals are sitting in their cells, waiting for the day they'll be let back into their community. We would change that and we will bring forward plans for a member's bill on this subject. And I am concerned at the main justice headline grab in the programme to extend the presumption against custodial sentences from three to 12 months. The people of Scotland will be horrified to hear the sorts of offences the SNP believe merit a presumption of non-custodial sentence. The most recent figures show more than 100 people were given a custodial sentence of less than 12 months for attempted murder or serious assault. Yes, 17% of those convicted of attempted murder or serious assault got less than 12 months. Under this programme, they could escape jail altogether. And there's more. The Scottish Government, together with Police Scotland, I have no time, I'm afraid, Mr Rumbles, repeatedly state that tackling domestic abuse is a top priority. Quite right. But of those guilty of attempted murder or serious assault from earlier, a considerable proportion were convicted with a domestic abuse aggravation. Presiding officer, it is bad enough for victims of crime to see their tormentor back on the streets immediately after sentencing. How much worse must it be for a domestic abuse victim to have to let their aggressor back into the home following a serious assault? Had this presumption against imprisonment been in place in 2015-16, 27 people convicted of sexual assault would have been spared incarceration. They, now, the SNP may claim that community-based alternatives are robust, but a third 
of community payback orders weren't even completed in 2015-16. And that figure is rising. They may claim their aim is reducing reoffending through rehabilitation. Then why has purposeful activity in prisons been slashed by 300,000 hours in the past year alone? I've no time, Mr Finney, sorry. Currently, more than 1,000 prisoners in Scotland aren't engaged in work or purposeful activity. That is 17% of Scotland's prison population. Presiding officer, the SNP don't like being accused of presiding over a soft-touch justice system, but that is exactly what is being delivered here. Prison serves four key purposes, to punish criminals, to deter would-be criminals, to keep the public safe, and to rehabilitate those who've taken a wrong turning in life. But under these plans, under this program for government, three of those basic tenants have been cast aside. Choosing to empty prisons rather than use them to keep the public safe is the wrong approach. And these misguided proposals do nothing to make Scotland safer. Presiding officer, in so many ways, not least justice, this is a tired programme from a tired government. Short on ideas, short on innovation, long on bluster and backbench sycophancy. Following 10 years of tears, the SNP wouldn't choose to start from here. But thanks to losing sight of the day-to-day -day issues that the people of Scotland care about, they are where they are. Not a programme for government, but a syllabus for soft-touch sentences. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for keeping to time too, Mr Kerr. Sandra White to be followed by Neil Findlay. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I, I very much welcome the programme for government, which has fairness, equality and ambition at its core, something the opposition benches, particularly the Tories, uh, fail to identify. And if I could just reply to some of the comments was made, <clears throat> has been someone who was a member of the Justice Committee, I think the work that has been going on in the prison just now, particularly the young men, the revolving doors, trying to stop that rehabilitation, that is a fantastic thing to see. And what you're saying just now actually puts you know, a shadow on the prison officers, the prison officers that mentor these young men, and the young men themselves. We should be proud of what's happening just now. We want to get rid of that revolving door. And I notice you used the word re rehabilitation at the very end. So it's not just trying to catch your, you know, press, con press coverage in the press. You should be looking at the fact that we are doing a good job. We are doing a good job, and if it was you or anyone else that was doing that to stop the revolving door in the justice system, in the prisons for these young uh, youth, then absolutely we should be applauding that. We shouldn't actually be decrying it. But, uh, presiding officer, that's not what I was wanting to start my remarks off, but I was uh, having been, as I said, visited uh, the prisons, etc. I think the work that's doing is, uh, there is, is, is very, very good. We can we do more? And we are trying to do more. Now, what I wanted to talk about is about the, this bill itself. It establishes the very first social security system in the UK based on the statutory principle that social security is a human right. And I think we must absolutely emphasise that, a human right. 11 benefits being devolved to the Scottish Parliament, disability living allowance, personal independence payments, attendance allowance, severe disablement allowance, industrial injuries, dis disability benefit, carers allowance, sure start maternity grant, uh, funeral expenses, cold weather payments, winter fuel payments, discretionary housing payments, and some powers in relation to universal credit. Uh, for, for example, the splitting of, uh, you know, paying of, um, you know, monies and, and rent, etc. Huge, huge, big bunch of powers. Unfortunately, we don't have the full powers. I just wish we had. And if Mr. O Mr. Kelly will take an intervention. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thanks, Sandra White, for uh, taking the intervention. She's just listed a whole raft of powers there. Can you maybe tell us when the SNP government are going to, have to actually start to use those powers mm. to make a difference? Sandra White. I, I really find it really rich coming from not just James Kelly, but the Labour Party. Uh, if the Labour Party had actually supported us in putting forward full powers for this parliament, we wouldn't have to have just 11, we'd have all of them. So take no lessons from you and we will be putting that forward. Uh, we will put this forward as it goes through the bill. It goes through the bill. The people who are using this just now are absolutely quite happy the way it's going. They've all said in evidence that you cannot push it too quickly because the mistakes that have been made by the... And you may laugh, you may laugh, but the mistakes have been made with the universal credit. 
just shows you that you cannot push this forward. And you ask some of the people we've had as witnesses, and you'll see these powers are coming. They'll come at the right time and the right pace as well. But pity you couldn't support us. You supported the Tories and the fact that we shouldn't have the full powers. So I won't take any lessons from you. Now, basically, this government, this parliament, have the opportunity to shape a distinctly Scottish social security system with dignity and its respect. As I said in reply to Mr Kelly, in stark contrast to the regime of the Tory government and the DWP. Now, the Social Security Committee, which I'm the convener of, is central to the passage of legislation, and more importantly, with the commitment from the Scottish Government to include those with lived experience, service users will also shape this bill, ensuring the services and processes are designed to deliver a system that is not only fit for purpose, but one has a commitment to human rights-based approach, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. The Scottish Government believes that people should get all the help they're entitled to. That is why the bill includes a statutory principle, which reflects the Scottish Government's commitment to help maximise people's incomes and encourage the take-up of all benefits. To date, the Scottish Government are committed to increasing benefits for carers to the same level as job seekers' allowance by introducing a carers' allowance supplement by summer 2018. Mr Kelly, there you go, will deliver the best start scheme grant by summer 2019. They are, Mr Kelly, another one, to increase support for low-income families with young children, introducing the funeral expenses assisted benefit by summer 2019, Mr Kelly, to provide critical financial support to people at difficult times, improve benefits for disabled people and people with ill health. And unlike the Tory government in Westminster, there will be no assessments carried out by the private sector, as indeed is reiterated today by the Minister Jeannie Freeman in answer to a question at the First Minister's questions time. The Scottish Government will also work with the Department of Work and Pensions to introduce flexibilities through universal credit in the way it is paid. I'm aware that there is a meeting of the committee, well, not my committee, but the Joint Ministerial Committee Group. I think it's in the 14th next week we'll discuss that, that very issue. And there will also be grants from the Welfare Fund and discretionary housing payments as well as providing help with heating costs and extending the winter fuel payment to families with severely disabled children. Most importantly, the Scottish Government will ensure that those who need support are aware of the benefits available to them with a campaign to maximise the benefit take-up. And I think that's important because we can provide the benefits of support but if there's a lack of awareness of what's available, the system will have failed. So I think that's an important part of it. And there is one issue, and I know I'm running out of time, so I want to raise this particular issue here. I really would be interested to know the view of the Tory members of the UN's judgment on the UK government attacks on disabled people. The International Committee of Disabled Human Rights Experts delivered a series of damning attacks on the UK government over its failure to implement the UN Disability Convention, with the chair of the committee telling the government's delegation that its cut to social security and other support for disabled people had caused a human catastrophe, which was totally neglecting the vulnerable situation, not neglecting, worsening the vulnerable situation people with disabilities find themselves in. Uh, it's a very damning report, it's not just damning, it's criminal. And I'd really like to hear a response when the next Tory gets up to speak. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. White. And I call on Neil Findlay to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Uh, President Officer, it's the fight against injustice that puts the the fire in my belly. So I want to highlight two areas in the programme for government where justice campaigners have brought about change. In 2013, my colleague Jenny Mara and I visited Amanda and Frank Koppel at their home in Kerry Muir, not long before Frank passed away. That visit will stay with me until the day I die, because we were moved by the pain of Frank's wife and family watching their husband and father taken by Alzheimer's, suffering the indignity of selling cher cherished items from a life in football to try and fund Frank's care. The announcement on Tuesday to address the issue of care provision based on age, not condition, is a victory for Amanda and her family. But they didn't do it for them. It's too late for Frank. They did it so others would not suffer the injustice they did. But I say to the Health Secretary, there must be no smoke and mirrors on this one. And it must be the start of addressing the overall crisis in social care that is here now. On period poverty, I know from the campaign to ban trans transvaginal mesh, how difficult it is to get the mainstream media to talk about issues of women's health and wellbeing. So I commend filmmaker Ken Loach, I commend Monica Lennon, my colleague and the Trussell Trust and all the other pressure groups who have brought this issue into the public consciousness. But this programme for government, 
Certainly. James Dornan. Well, you also commend Gillian Martin and the Women for Independence and many of the other people who were raising this issue some time ago, because I would hate to think that you were just being parochial uh, uh, on this. Neil if, Mr. if Mr Dornan would listen, I said all of the other pressure groups who brought this issue into the public consciousness. Uh, so it might be beneficial to listen, Mr Dornan. This uh, programme for government completely fails, though, on the biggest issue affecting every community in every town, and that is the unprecedented and sustained attack on local services through a deliberate policy of chronic underfunding. £1.9 billion has been cut from our council since 2010. Now, we know the Tories loathe local government. They've never believed in the public provision of services funded by our collective taxes. That's why, time and again, they've used the law uh, to restrict the power of councils and councillors. Rate capping, the poll tax, the sale of council houses, competitive tender and the abolition of the regions, surcharging and more. We expect that from the Tories. That is why they exist. But in recent years, the SNP have exceeded even the Tories. A central imposed council tax freeze, centralisation of police, fire and other services, and cut after cut after cut after cut. And now, education reforms that Michael Forsyth would not have dared introduce. Council revenue funding, down by 11% since 2010. In West Lothian, 96 million has gone and another 66 million is to go. Mid Lothian have 42 million more to cut and Edinburgh and I watering 148 million. I have not heard a word about that from any SNP backbencher and I do not expect it. Tens of thousands of jobs have gone already. Clare Hockey was mentioned and 20,000 jobs have gone in the English NHS. A scandal. It pales into insignificance to the number of jobs that have gone in local government. But nobody mentions it on the government side. Nobody mentions it. And if jobs have gone in the environmental services that keep our streets clean and safe and social services that support the elderly, young and vulnerable. Grants to voluntary groups cut, then frozen, then ended altogether. Education support staff on temporary contracts and then they're not renewed. Youth work cut. Staff undervalued and grossly underpaid. No thank you. I welcome the end to the pay cap. But it has to be funded and go some way to making up for the seven years of wage decline. And we need new cash. It cannot be funded from more jobs and service cuts. And you know, if a factory shuts or jobs are lost in any sector, we see a task force, the PACE team, other government support. What support have our council workers received? Absolutely nothing. I say to the government, this cannot go on. It breaks my heart to see the services built up over years by skilled public servants and dedicated councillors of all parties being systematically dismantled. It's the oldest trick in the book. Underfund services to the point they cannot function, accuse them of being ineffective, either hive them off or expect the third sector to pick up the pieces at a reduced rate. No thank you. And all the while, poverty and health inequality increases. Walk the streets of this city any morning and you will see the rough sleepers, the homeless, those with mental health and addiction problems. A 10 million fund to address rough sleeping at a time when 1.9 billion has been ripped out of council services and IGBs have had their drug and alcohol budgets slashed several times, several times that number is actually a tragic insult. Because councils are the front line in the fight against poverty and health inequality. Housing, schools, mental health projects, day centres, classroom assistance, libraries and youth workers, welfare rights and social work, community centres, home care, planning, economic development, transport. That's the front line. The health services, health service fixes our health. These services prevent it in the first place. And these are the very services that civilise our society and are being eroded, eroded to the point where senior council officers fear we're heading to a point where there is where it's the only possible option is that they can provide only statutory services. That is a damning indictment of 10 years of this government in which every time rhetoric triumphs over reality. Thank you, Mr Findlay. I call on Richard Lockhead to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Richard Lockhead. Thank you, presiding officer. I guess it's a somewhat sad reflection of our political culture that the position of opposition parties is always that government programmes and government announcements are disappointing and, and too modest and that parties that have been in power for 10 years or more have always run out of ideas and run out of steam. 
But actually, speaking as an MSP who's been in this chamber since 1999, I have to say, when I read the programme for government and heard the First Minister's statement, I was actually very genuinely impressed. There's a sense of refresh about it, and it is an ambitious, bold programme. It's going to make a real difference to Scotland's economy if it's implemented, to social justice in this country, and an interest I have, of course, is in the future of Scotland's environment uh, as well, and generally improve the quality of life of people living in this country. So I am impressed with this programme for government. I should say, I think one of the opening uh, remarks in the programme is perhaps an understatement when it says that Brexit will continue to provide the backdrop to much that we do over the next year, because there is a danger that the Brexit negotiations and the way they go will undermine many of the good intentions the Scottish Government have and this Parliament share. Uh, being a loyal MSP, I, of course, read the Press and Journal uh, every day of the week, and I noticed this morning there was two stories of the dangers posed by Brexit to the north of Scotland in the farming pages. The headline, Warning Overcut and Migrant Workforce, where Manette Batters, the Deputy President of the National Farmers Union, that's the English NFU, of course, said an abrupt reduction in the number of EU workers able to work in the UK after we leave the EU would cause massive disruptions to the entire food supply chain. And, of course, the other main story in the p &G this morning was Aberdeen may face brain drain due to Brexitus. Aberdeen is facing a brain drain of EU citizens with almost 50%, I'll repeat that, 50% planning to leave Scotland due to Brexit. It has been claimed the figures come from an international study from KPMG which showed Scotland faces losing nearly 63,000 EU citizens, mostly young qualified workers with highly demanded skills such as IT and engineering. So I do suspect that the next year or so it's going to be overshadowed by the Brexit negotiations uh, and the impact on Scotland. Uh, last week I was very lucky to have a good briefing from the income maximisation section at the Murray Council that was set up recently, where I learned that 50% of the funding for this very valuable unit that's helping hundreds of families across, across Murray, particularly some of the more vulnerable members of our society, cope with welfare reforms and ensure they're getting the, the benefits they're entitled to, the fact that 50% of their funding comes from Europe was a surprise to me. And it just shows you how the EU funding issue, never mind the labour issues I've just mentioned, filtrate right in through all corners of our society and make a real difference to people's lives. In terms of income maximisation, I do welcome in the programme for government the idea of providing a financial health check to families on low incomes because of the impact that welfare reforms are having on our society. And of course, as Sandra White said, I also welcome the new social security agency that's been set up with 1,500 members of staff to be recruited to work in that. And I would urge the Scottish Government to make sure that all 1,500 members are not in the central belt or in our main cities, but that many of the 1,500 workers uh, are working in our communities the length and breadth of Scotland, and particularly uh, in rural Scotland. And the fact that the creation of a new social security system is going to be created with dignity and respect at its heart, of course, is a very welcome comment, especially when we contrast that with what's happening with the UK government, which has just been slammed by the UN for grave and systematic violation of disabled people's rights. The social security system we set up must make life easier for people, not what the UK government system is doing, which is making life harder, and it must support claimants, not pile on the pain as is happening at the moment. We have an issue in Murray, for instance, where the assessments that are being carried out at the moment mean that many people in Murray have to travel to Inverness to have those carried out. People who are not capable of travelling, people with anxiety problems, people with serious mental health issues. I have got anecdote after anecdote that's been sent to me in the last 24 hours about the pain and stress that people in Murray are being put through because they can't get the assessments on their own doorstep in their Murray communities. So I'll be raising that issue with Scottish ministers and hope they'll put pressure on the UK ministers. We'll also be raising this, minister, uh, this issue with, uh, as well as the Department of Work and Pensions. It's an outrageous situation. I've got situations where people are spending money on their own fuel to take their clients to these assessments in the Vernest because they've got no way of getting there under their own steam. I've got people on the phone to me, as I had yesterday from some of my local communities, uh, really, really anxious because they simply can't make the journey. So the, this is the characteristics of the social security system we have from the UK government, and I very much welcome the fact that the system that's going to come uh, under the programme for government is going to have much more compassion at its heart. Can I also say over the next year that I hope that uh, the Scottish government will put pressure on the UK government on a whole host of other issues that potentially may undermine many of our good intentions uh, in this parliament. Uh, this morning, a constituent in Keith uh, called me, or emailed me, I should say, 
to tell me that Lloyd Pharmacy want to charge him an extra £50 for delivery to his AB55 postcode of a mobility scooter for his terminally ill wife, despite, despite the fact the website suggests that delivery to UK addresses is free. Another situation utterly lacking compassion in this day and age, and Lloyd's and other companies should be delivering free when it comes to medical equipment to north of Scotland and other rural areas uh, of the country as well. And I urge the UK government to go on and sort out the regulation in terms of these exorbitant discriminatory delivery charges we experience in rural and northern areas and other areas uh, of Scotland. So I urge UK ministers implement this programme for government. It's very ambitious, it's radical, but also we have to make sure Scotland's voice is heard and we influence some of these ridiculous draconian policies and decisions that are being taken place by the Conservative government in Westminster. Thank you, Mr Lockhead. I call on Graeme Simpson to be followed by John Mason. Graeme Simpson. Presiding officer, last year Nicola Sturgeon came before this chamber and outlined a programme for government containing 13 bills. Three have been passed. This year she's presented us with 16 bills, some of them repeats, to join the queue. So the first question is this. How are we to take seriously a programme from a government with such a poor record of delivery? Delivery that's needed. There's little more important to people than having a roof over their head. Yet after 10 years of SNP government, we have too many people sleeping on the streets every night. You can see it just yards from this building. We've got, we've got 5,000 children classified as homeless. 5,000 children. We have more than 10,000 households in temporary accommodation, many in bed and breakfast, some for as long as 18 months. That's up from last year. Of those households, more than 3,000, also an increase, have children. This government has failed the most needy in society. The Scottish Government, the Scottish Conservatives, have called for a nationwide homelessness strategy. All parties, all parties bar the SNP, called for that. So we can give a cautious welcome to having an objective to end rough sleeping. However, aiming to do something and promising to do it and then delivering are very different things. Was this, government's, was this government's response to the homelessness crisis? And it is a crisis. Cabinet Secretary for Health, Shona Robertson. Does the member take any responsibility for the issues of concern that he raises, people sleeping rough, people in crisis, that some of that might just have something to do with the welfare changes that have been pushed through by his Tory yeah, yeah. UK yeah. government? I see them all the time in my surgery. I would think he might see some of them as well. Will he be honest in accepting the responsibility of his own government for much of that? Graeme Simpson. <laughs> Graeme Simpson. The SNP is the government in Scotland. The homelessness, crisis, the homelessness crisis has been getting worse under the SNP, and you have so far rejected having a nationwide uh, uh, policy to, to deal with this. So what's the response? set up a focus group and a fund, but with no clear message on what they actually want to do. Now, people become homeless for all sorts of reasons. Helping them isn't easy. I'm not pretending it is. But why not announce something that we know does work? A housing first approach, where the first thing someone who presents themselves as homeless gets is a home. To achieve that, of course, we actually need more homes. That's why we on these benches have been looking at how to achieve that. Last week, Ruth Davidson set out some of our ideas, like creating a new generation of new towns backed by a new national housing and infrastructure agency and with a minister in cabinet leading the charge. Not that I want to promote Kevin Stewart, presiding officer. Or unlocking land and its value to put into infrastructure using land value capture. Radical thinking of the kind that's needed, not talking shops, but leadership. We think, and Homes for Scotland can we, can we agree with us. Can we just hear the us. member run and have conversations across him? Mr Simpson, continue, please. Uh, I'll, I'll apologise on Mr Fraser's uh, behalf. <laughs> <laughs> we, we think, and Homes for Scotland agree with us, that we need 25,000 
new homes being built in Scotland every year, every year, across all 10 years. And that's not happening. If we got on and built those new towns, we have the chance to be forward thinking and design them in a way that meets energy reduction targets. We could set energy efficiency targets that exceed most of what's being built at the moment, design streets that work for pedestrians, cyclists, and yes, motorists, design in the green spaces that people want. On the subject of cyclists, presiding officer, I do personally welcome the increase in funding for active travel, and I look forward to seeing Humza Yousaf at Pedal for Scotland on Sunday. I hope he's not put off by the weather forecast. We don't just need new homes. We need to improve existing ones. Thousands of properties in Scotland are standing on a condition cliff edge. We need action to help people in tenements, for example, to improve the homes they live in. We'll have more to say on this in the coming weeks and months. But part of the answer to improving poor living conditions, which can lead to breathing problems, skin complaints, depression, marriage breakdown, is to improve energy efficiency. The announcement of a warm homes bill is not new. It was announced last year, but there is still no mention of it, including measures to improve energy efficiency. Fuel poverty affects a third of households in Scotland. Last week, I, along with Alex Rowley, Liam MacArthur and Mark Ruskell, an unlikely allowance I grant you, wrote to Kevin Stewart. We called on him in the Warm Homes Bill to set a date for the eradication of fuel poverty. The programme for government says the bill will, quote, set a new statutory fuel poverty target, which is not quite the same thing. Presiding officer, I realise I'm tight for time, so I'll end by saying we need to do more to tackle homelessness, we need to build more new homes, we need to improve energy efficiency, improve the homes that already exist. The time for talking is over, it's time for action. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I call on John Mason to be followed by Daniel Johnson. John Mason. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. There have been a number of speeches so far in this debate, so I want to respond to some of the points uh, as well as making uh, some of my own. Uh, but firstly, I mean, there have been several mentions of the new fourth crossing, which I certainly welcome, but I'd like to particularly mention the success of the M8, M73, M74 completion, which I think has been a huge success and is making life so much better for many businesses and individuals, including in my constituency. I am Vice Convener of the Economy Committee, so you might not be surprised that I would like to say something about the economy uh, in my speech today. And firstly, I would like to focus on some of the events that have been happening this week. Now, one of the key challenges for Scotland is our lack of growth in population. It is incredibly difficult to grow an economy with a static population. And I think it was Jack McConnell who really took a lead on this and understood it and realized that we had to tackle it. And we have seen a leveling off of the previous downward decline and a slight increase in recent years, which is more than welcome. But I would suggest that any Scottish government will find it difficult to match economic growth in England if our population growth falls way behind theirs. And that is why it is all the more disappointing this week that the UK government has not involved Scotland in their thinking about immigration post-Brexit. As colleagues have said, this will impact both on individual businesses, but I would also suggest it will affect the whole economy. It was clear in yesterday's speech by Rosanna Cunningham that the economy is much wider than a simplistic measure like GDP, and it needs to include factors like the environment and inclusivity. There is no point growing GDP by 5% or 10% per year if only a very few people benefit from that growth. So I was a bit disappointed at both Jackie Bailey and Dean Lockhart yesterday, who both seem to take a very simplistic emphasis on GDP when they are both on the economic committee and they both know it is much more complex than that. Productivity is another word that is banded around, but again, there is a danger we use it too simplistically. At least on the surface, reducing the number of staff in a restaurant or care home might suggest that the remaining staff are becoming more productive. Yet is that what we actually want from a care home or a restaurant? Maybe we would rather have more staff in the restaurant to provide customers with better service, and maybe we'd rather have more staff in the care home to make sure the residents were looked after better. So I do very much welcome the emphasis in this programme of including a wide range of factors within the economy. For example, the use of electric or low emission vehicles, 
As the First Minister said, quote, we welcome innovation, we want to lead it, unquote. So the target of no new petrol or diesel vehicles after 2032, I think is ambitious, it's challenging, and it's exciting. On the Economy Committee, we also cover energy, and I think a number of us were impressed by the possibilities for hydrogen-powered vehicles, as well as electric ones. While electric cars probably have a higher profile for the time being, I do believe that hydrogen should be seriously considered, as it potentially gives options for storing energy, for refuelling vehicles faster, and for also being used in the existing gas network. Related to this is the commitment to low emission zones in the four biggest cities by 2020, which I think is a big step in the right direction. Secondly, the further work to be done on the citizen's basic income, or universal basic income as some know it, I think is also very welcome. It certainly seems to me that in a wealthy country like ours, every individual and every family should be guaranteed a certain income which is unconditional. Of course, extra income above the basic can be made conditional, but I do not accept that basics like food, clothing and shelter should be conditional on anything. Surely these are basic essentials in a country like ours. Although Ruth Davidson suggested she would not welcome citizens' basic income, there is actually support for it from right-wing parties in other countries on the grounds of removing much of the complexity of the welfare system. And thirdly, I look forward to the paper on income tax options. Not an easy subject, and we do have to be aware of what England does as people can move around. Too big a difference on the top rates could be a bit of a risk, and we do need to make changes carefully and see how people will react. We have to accept uh, we are limited by not having control of the national insurance system, which is effectively part of the income tax system, and which is not really progressive at all. But we are where we are, and I look forward to the debate on this topic. Now, just turning to some of the comments from the Conservative Party, if I have understood their position correctly, they want more spending on health, more spending on education, and possibly in other areas, but they also want to cut taxes, and like to use this phrase that Scotland could be the highest tax part of the UK. In response to that, I would just say, firstly, that their position is inconsistent. If they are serious about more staff in the schools and more staff in the NHS, then they have to tell us where that money is coming from. And secondly, they make the mistake that taxation is inherently bad. If Scotland has the best public services in the UK that attracts families and businesses to come here because of our quality of life and the quality of the workforce, then it can be a very positive thing that our taxes are higher. The con yeah, absolutely. Martin Friesen. I'm grateful to Mr Mason for, for giving way. I'm always interested in listening to, to his arguments, but surely he himself is self-contradictory because he is a member of a party that supports cutting air passenger duty a tax in order to grow the economy and therefore stimulate greater tax revenues. Can you not see that his own party stance is just a reflection of what we have been arguing on a larger scale? John Mason. I think one of the strengths of the SNP is A, that we are in government and have been repeatedly put there by the public, and secondly, that we are realistic, we are willing to take on good ideas from other places, but we are not going to go to the hypocritical place where the Conservatives are of cutting tax and increasing expenditure, or the ridiculous place that Neil Finlay explained to us this afternoon where you just want more money on everything eh, and you never know where it's going to come from. The Conservatives confuse the overall size of the economy with how our income and wealth is shared. These two are not the same. No, I don't think I've Mr. Time. Mason's in his last minute. Th thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I just uh, welcome a couple of other issues that are in uh, the programme? Very much welcome the proposals on organ donation and also on rough sleeping. And I do have to say again, it's a bit rich coming from the Conservatives and Graham Simpson in particular that the party of right to buy, the party of selling off council housing, the party of sanctions pretends that it cares about homelessness. Presiding officer, so ve I'm very happy to conclude and welcome this programme for government. We will all spend a lot of time looking at the detail of it, but for now it's sufficient that we agree that we want a healthy and growing economy, but we also want a society that is more fair fairness and less inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Marie Todd. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Bold and ambitious. Well, I think one thing we can all agree on is that the First Minister's spin doctors were working overtime in the lead-up to Tuesday's speech. The biggest surprise, though, of my first year as an MSP is just how little legislating we've done in the last year. So maybe bold and ambitious was less spin and more necessity, making up for a year where we had lots of talk but very little action. 
But unfortunately and disappointingly, the speech did not match the spin. The First Minister spoke of bold action, but the detail shows that these were merely bold words. The bold ideas might have been things such as the Greens policy on citizens' basic income or our proposals to use the tax powers of this Parliament. But all the First Minister has done is announce that she will talk about these things. Bold ideas, but no commitment. But of course, there were things that we welcomed, such as on early years and a Scottish investment bank. But neither of these things are new. They are re-announced or reheated. But I agree with one thing in particular. In education, yes, we certainly do need bold and ambitious action. But in terms of what was announced, it was not bold, it was blinkered. It was not ambitious, it was dogmatic. Rather than new ideas, we got a reassertion of John Sweeney's unpopular reforms and a commitment to keep on going regardless. His own consultation shows just how widespread concern and mistrust of his reforms are. Parents, teachers, academics, unions, experts. Minister Sweeney has struggled to find any support from any of these quarters. And in the debate that has followed, it is clear that none of the opposition parties are willing to support his proposals. So for all the Deputy First Minister's reputation for competence, there is a very real danger that he will fail to pass an education bill through this Parliament. There is only one potential source of agreement, and that is from the Conservative voices from across this chamber. And that should be no surprise, because the assumptions and insights that drive these reforms have a precedent. The same logic, the same dogma, the same solution to schools pursued by the Conservative government of the 1980s with, uh, 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 lies at the heart of these reforms. With his governance review, John Swinney is simply bringing Ken Baker's school reforms to Scotland. Centralisation of control of schools, undermining local accountability, national funding of schools, ministerial micromanagement of what is taught in our classrooms. These are the hallmarks of Ken Baker's reforms and the same formula the Deputy First Minister is applying to Scotland. So it was therefore odd to see Mr Swinney pick an argument with a potential ally from across the chamber in Liz Smith. He argued that you had to support his reforms because uh, any reform must be good reform, and the only possible reform were his reforms. In short, John Swinney's argument seems to be one of reform for reform's sake. He is simply out of touch. The... Gladly. Liz Smith. I'm interested in what the member is saying, because we are very clear indeed that we do not support quite a number of the Swinney proposals. But could the Labour Party explain whether or not they are in favour of the principle of reform to raise standards in our schools, which have been declining for such a long period of time. Daniel Johnson. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two very clear reforms that we need. We need reform in terms of resource because we have seen declining levels of investment, but also, and as the member will be aware, we have heard evidence after evidence in, in uh, Education Committee around the mistakes made by Education Scotland and the SQA. We've seen the, 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 the reams and reams of guidance and support coming from Education Scotland. We've seen the, the mishandling of the introduction of new examinations. And both of these uh, institutions have been left completely untouched by John Swinney's reform. Indeed, Education Scotland is being placed at the very heart of his reform and central control of the education system. So if we want to look at reform, we need to look at reform of these central institutions. Because, and, and, and coming back to my key point, the real issue at heart of this, and indeed I think the real issue that Liz Smith had on Tuesday, and one that we, where we agree with the criticism, is that the creation of regional collaborators will change our school system fundamentally. Regional directors will be appointed by the Chief Inspector of Schools, a role that will report directly to the Cabinet Secretary for Education. So where will parents go if they don't agree with the annual improvement plan that the regional director will be mandated to produce? What will happen if a head teacher disagrees with the regional director? There'll be no local accountability for education policy or redress for its de delivery. And head teachers are now part of a chain of command that ends at the cabinet secretary's desk and explicitly links the inspection regime to the local management of schools. When the head teacher disagrees with the regional director, he will know only too well that metaphorically his desk sits just across the hallway from the school inspector. And while these plans for governance are wrong-headed, when it comes to school finance, they are downright confused. The government is currently consulting on how it will fund schools. And what is clear is that it wants to set budgets centrally. What is far from clear is how. 
It does not matter how strenuously denials are made in this chamber or in glossy consultation documents. Central setting of school budgets necessitates a method of calculation, one that turns national priorities into local budgets. Deputy Presiding Officer, if it looks like a funding formula, if it sounds like a funding formula, if it acts like a funding formula, then it is a national funding formula. And we only have to look at the turmoil south of the border to see where that leads. Deputy Presiding Officer, and in closing, it is clear that these changes are neither bold or ambitious. They are dogmatic and being stubbornly pursued. These changes are not supported by any of the parties in this parliament. These changes are not supported by parents. These changes are not supported by teachers. Mr Swinney must stop and actually listen to the voices of criticism. The change Mr Swinney must make is one of direction and to stop these reforms based on discredited policies from the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I call Marie Todd to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Ms Todd, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like so many folk this week, both in Scotland and internationally, I was delighted by the bold and ambitious plan for Scotland that the First Minister set out on Tuesday. From lifting the public sector pay cap to restricting the advertising of junk food, investing in active transport and the electrification of the newly dual day nine, there is plenty for the people that I represent to welcome. Today is my first opportunity to put on the record just how delighted I am at the announcement that ferry fares in the Northern Isles are to be reduced. An excellent example of this government working for our rural and island communities and delivering on manifesto promises. In looking to the future of Scotland, I find myself in the very unusual position of agreeing with something that Adam Tompkins said on Tuesday. In Scotland, we are not short of challenges and we are not short of new political thinking designed to address and combat them. I completely agree with that. We do face a unique set of challenges, like our ageing population and our vast and rural geography, particularly in the Highlands. And these will often mean that we in Scotland have to lead change rather than follow in its wake. We will have to be bold and do things that may not have been done before. And I know that that is tough for those in this chamber of a conservative nature who like things to stay the same. The First Minister was absolutely right on Tuesday when she said that no one has ever built a better country by always taking the easy option. So we'll need new political thinking to overcome the challenges ahead. A prime example being the government's openness to ideas like citizens' basic in income, which is one of the new and ambitious ideas that's growing around the world. One of the most powerful things a successful government can do is create the environment where its people can flourish. I want to talk about a particular project we have in the Highlands, which demonstrates that this SNP government has done that is doing that and will continue to do exactly that. It's an award-winning project attracting international interest, which has received a great deal of support from across many portfolios in this government. It covers housing, digital innovation, health and social care, employability and skills, low carbon economy, caring for our veterans, and business with a social purpose. Health and social care integration is going to be absolutely essential. And Scotland is leading the way in the UK on this. We, the people of Scotland, should be justifiably proud of that. In common with everyone in this chamber, I imagine, I want to grow old and frail in my own community. In the Highlands, we've been working on a way to make that happen. So fit homes have been developed as a result of a collaboration between Alban Housing Association NHS Highland and Carbon Dynamic, a modular build construction company which is a private enterprise with a social purpose. That's where the green credentials come from and the employability strand comes from. And also involved at the design stage are the very people who will soon live in these houses. These people share the Scottish Government's vision of a fairer, more equal country and have been empowered to deliver that vision in their local area and very soon beyond it. 
The fit homes are modular units which can either stand alone or be added to existing homes. They're top quality construction. They're easy to keep warm, you'll be pleased to hear. And they're um, change with changing needs. The same construction that's going into these social houses is going into shooting lodges and the estates of wealthy folk in the highlands nearby. They're fitted with cutting edge technology which can monitor health and enable folk to stay at home where otherwise they'd be in hospital. It's a preventative healthcare project which can improve patient care, free up hospital beds, and was developed by innovators in the Highlands to meet our unique healthcare challenges. It's an example of the great things that can happen when we create the environment in which people can flourish. The Fit Home Project is also focusing on preventative interventions using artificial intelligence developed around case-based analytics originally developed for our oil and gas industry, transposing that knowledge base into the health and care field. This will allow health and care agencies to intervene more quickly if it's appropriate to do so, and it might potentially prevent admissions to hospital ever being needed. And through a social enterprise model, they're going to reinvest profit back into health and care delivery. The investment and the commitment that this government has made in enterprise and innovation, in health and social care integration, and their willingness to work cross-portfolio and to try new things is well established. Their investment in super-fast broadband infrastructure, closing the many gaps left by the UK government, as mentioned in yesterday's debate, has enabled this type of technology to be developed in the Highlands. Seeing a social enterprise from the Highlands partnering to develop cutting edge artificial intelligence, virtual reality and preventative health solutions provides vision and aspiration to all of us. And I know that those involved have not just UK but global aspirations. So, presiding officer, let me finish by saying I do believe that the programme for government outlined on Tuesday will create a better environment for people to flourish and will build the nation of leaders and innovators that Scotland can be. I believe that because I see it already. Uh, I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Bob Doris. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part in day three of the debate on the response to the Government's programme for Scotland. I want to ensure that my constituents are part of a, an inclusive, fair, prosperous and innovative country. Firstly, I'd like to point to the cultural str uh, strategy being developed and published in 2018, following yet another public consultation. We know that culture is a driving force in our local communities and in our nation. Culture plays a central role, a role in attitudes, values and relationships. My new constituency of Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire is an example of a place buzzing with a vibrant and thriving culture. Summer has been jam-packed with a full programme of cultural experiences. In Selkirk, I was lucky enough to participate in the common riding, from the town square up to the three brethren on a coloured hiling horse called Vinnie. Proudly, this year's Royal Borough Standard Bearer, Kieran Riddle, rode ahead in a spectacle of community spirit, showcasing our unique borders identity. Other highlights of the summer were Kelso Civic Week, marking its 80th anniversary along with Hoyt, Coldstream and Jedburgh. It is great traditions like Civic Weeks and Common Ridings that teach us important values, values of inclusivity and acceptance and pride in Scotland's towns and their histories. It's fundamentally important, however, to teach these ideals from an early age and ingrain them within our communities. Civic Weeks have young people at its core, laddies and lasses appointed, appointed as guardians of a rich tradition. What better example to show the confidence and respect we have in the next generation by trusting these young people to honour and respect traditions that date back decades. In advance of the year of young people, I must highlight that the Scottish borders isn't working for everyone. We're losing youth to the lure of the big cities. Many leave for university and don't return. We need to question why. To lose some of our best and brightest because they don't recognise the borders as professionally advantageous, or indeed a place to raise a family, is the fault of this government's central belt agenda. Somewhere along the line, young people start to believe that the borders might not just be the place for them, 
no longer able to satisfy their future aspirations, whether it be a warm and affordable home, a good education, support to start a business, the opportunity to gain skills, a sense of fairness, of inclusivity, or just to be happy. We have the powers to create the right environment for young people to stay in the place they grew up, to study, to live and to work, and to give back to their communities. We must also encourage leavers to return, visitors to settle, and new people to come and invest. We shouldn't forget the values and needs of these young people. Their opinion and contribution is valued, and they provide us with new ideas for innovation and entrepreneurial fresh thinking. It's all good and well encouraging people to visit, and even better for people to stay. But to do that, there needs to be the infrastructure to support that. In that respect, I look forward to the infrastructure plans being published soon. The biggest issue, the number one issue that impacts lives of people every day is slow broadband. The programme for government calls for more effective development of community broadband projects. In my experience, community broadband provides endless bureaucratic nonsense that does little to improve broadband issues in rural constituencies. Poor broadband speeds have a detrimental impact to local economies, especially rural ones. It damages business, businesses, small and large, and impacts on lives. Constituents contact me complaining of slow broadband or broadband disruption daily. Yes, I will. Clear hockey. Intervention. Can I ask her what representation she's made to the UK government with regards to improving broadband? I thank, Hamilton. I thank Claire Helke for that intervention. Um, I did in fact write to uh, Fergus Ewing and uh, he, he set out his stall by responding by saying that deployment timescales and related targets will be determined through the procurement process which will be launched later this year. And so forgive me if um, I lay that out to you because my... my um, constituents are very sceptical about what the Scottish Government are doing. One constituent, Claire Hockey, might be interested to know, moved to the borders with a promise of super-fast broadband. Can I make this point, please? Five years on, the constituent is still waiting and now considering relocating. Is that what we want for our rural constituencies in a minute? Areas not yet equipped to deal You're with... in your last I... minute. Well, could I get some extra time, please? I'm giving you some extra time, but you're getting about 30 seconds it's now. It's time Thank rural you. Constitu constituencies were told when broadband was coming and every effort to make sure it's fast. The fact is, geographical barriers still exist and rural constituencies are left behind. Rural constituencies tend to be fairly large, but without adequate transport infrastructure too. More potholes than ro roads, more horses than buses, and a train that drops you off at the station with no link to go further. We need sense... I don't have enough time, I'm really sorry. We need sensible policies, starting with an integrated transport system that makes living, working and enjoying accessible. Civic Week's common ridings that people can travel to with ease. Cultural attra attractions that are adequately signposted. Young and old, from close and afar, to access jobs, culture and tradition. And although the programme for Scotland makes reference to the Seven Stains mountain biking in Scotland, yet only aims to introduce dedicated carriages for cycles and other outdoor sports equipment on rural routes in the north and west, why not mention Borders Rail? Although already through oversight, the south of Scotland is being left out of initiatives that it would otherwise benefit from. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, as culture at the forefront as a driver, other parts of Scotland can share in the growth of Scotland's cities have too. But to do that, we need to get the basics right. The infrastructure and the availability of housing to keep young talent and to attract new talent. Uh, thank you. Before I call Bob Doris a couple of housekeeping uh, matters, can I just remind you, you're the penultimate speaker, Mr Doris, so can I remind that members who have spoken in the debate over the course of the previous two days should also be here for closing speeches. So they're in their offices watching now, start making your way to the chamber. And I also say to the front, a point of order.
participate in the first day of the debate, and I have returned to the Chamber, Presiding Officer. I see Mr Fraser and Mr Kelly, who have been present throughout the three days of the debate, will be responding for their parties. I can see no one in the government front bench who was here yesterday during the proceedings. Is it competent for somebody to respond to a debate who has not been present to hear it? Uh, that's not a matter for the chair, that's a matter for the government who they put up to respond to debates. As you well know, Mr Carlo, that's more time taken up. I was going to say the front benches will also have an extra minute or so now in hand in their summing up. You're all very experienced. I know you'll be able to speak for an extra minute without too much trouble. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Richard Lyle. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think Mr Carlaw was just trying to buy some time, so back benches and get to the chamber to hear my speech, so thank you very much for that, <laughs> Mr Carlaw. Um, Presiding Officer, this programme for government is bursting at the seams with ambition for Scotland, and I would like to use my contribution to highlight a number of opportunities that I feel the Scottish Government can seize to develop it further, to build on what is already in the programme outlined the other day. So, for example, the Safe Staffing Bill will enshrine in law the principles of safe staffing in the NHS, starting with nursing and midwifery workforce planning tools. That's not a new thing. It began the development in 2013. So we'll see the correct clinicians in the correct place at the right time and at the correct staffing levels. Record numbers of staff in our NHS with record funding from the Scottish Government underpinned now with a safe workforce levels on a statutory footing. We should all welcome that and we should all support that. But we can go further. I would seek information from the Scottish Government on how workforce planning tools can be developed further in the social care sector. With health and social care integration, our care home sector should be part of an integrated approach to staffing levels and skills mix. I'd also maybe at this point also say that every time I hear the Scottish Government talk about the five new elective centres for uh, surgery, particularly for our older citizens, the £200 million pounds around that, I, thought, I really, really welcome that. But that should really be designated as community health spend, because that money is going to be spent enabling people to stay in their houses. And I think actually budgeting that money as part of the acute sector is actually financially wrong. That is a community initiative, and I think it gives a false impression of the money that we're actually investing in community health. I'd like to move on to uh, the education bill now, and of course uh, the Parliament should scrutinise it in, in great detail. However, more localised control by head teachers, guided by the hopes and the desires and the needs of young people and their families, is something we should all support, and supported by local authorities and uh, re regional mechanisms also. Yes, we have to look at the details, but we can surely support that, depending on how much time I have. Yes, you can take the intervention yeah. if you wish. Daniel Johnson. I thank the member for giving way, but the, the key point of the proposals they've been set out is that regional directors will be in control of policy and they will be put in place by central government. How is that compatible with the localism you just painted? Bob well, Doris. Well, I'll say more about the localism uh, as, as a developer in my speech, but I, I would ask you to engage with the bill rather than just turn your face against it at this early stage. I think that's, the, I think that's just the wrong approach. And I don't recognise the funding position of Scotland schools as some of the opposition parties have actually outlined here today. That's not the position in my constituency in Maryhill and Springburn, where an additional £3 million plus each year will now be invested to boost attainment direct to schools through the Pupil Equity Fund. That's something to be absolutely welcomed. Now, I want to say one final thing in education before I move on to transport. In this chamber, in January 2009, when we were discussing the new uh, national qualifications that are now in place, I actually raised concerns of unintended consequences about the lack of an exit exam in relation to uh, NAT 4s and, 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 and other qualifications. So I just wanted to raise that, given its topicality at the moment. And I'd like to move to the transport bill now, presiding officer. Uh, so I really hope we do see additional powers and regulations given to, to, to local authorities, because my experience in Glasgow, uh, with First Glasgow, who I do my best to build a constructive relationship with, genuinely, but it's not, it's not always the easiest thing in the world, but they are very courteous, and I'm trying to get that dialogue going, is there's just no consultation process whatsoever when that company decides to change, alter or axe a service, they would say the four-week notice they give to the Regional Transport Authority is that consultation. No, it's not, and it's not good enough. Consultations about service alterations or cancellations must be put on a statutory basis, and I hope that's in the Transport Bill when it emerges. I also hope the Transport Bill gives considerations uh, to co-producing routes or changing tendering rules in relation to routes, because quite often what happens is a bus company puts a service on 
knowing that it's socially desirable, knowing that it's going to lose money, they pull the plug on it and the Regional Transport Authority moves in to subsidise it. There's got to be a better way of doing things. Huge opportunities in the Transport Bill and everyone in this chamber should be uh, welcoming that. Uh, delighted to see the Child Poverty Bill uh, been mentioned. Also delighted to see the £50 million fund to start to look at directing monies, not, not to solve <coughs> child poverty, but to, to flesh out that framework that the Parliament's legislating on at the moment. Uh, uh, the Evening Times reported earlier this year that 2,000 uh, families in Glasgow were using food banks during the, the school holidays. I'm delighted to see the SNP city government in Glasgow now looking at uh, mechanisms by which to make sure every young person will get fed during the school holidays, not means tested in community centres, in schools or whatever. But I think there might even be a, a better way of doing it. In my constituency, I see a network of football clubs, dance groups, youth clubs, drama societies, music groups, sports groups, the Scouts, a whole vibrant variety of organisations who do sometimes struggle for cash, but they do also during the summer holidays in October week. They offer effectively subsidised childcare. You pay £50 and your kid goes to a football camp for two weeks. Well, let's use some of that money to fund some of these organisations so that each young person, when they come to their summer holidays or their Easter break or their October week, could have a schedule of activities via the drama clubs, the football clubs, the dance groups, the youth groups, the music, the sports societies, and let's make sure they get a meal whilst they're there. There could be a more integrated way of tackling child poverty that actually boosts the, the, the other educational opportunities uh, for young people and their social development out with school. So I can see that I'm starting to run out of time, presiding officer. What I've tried to do today genuinely is what most other people haven't done, unfortunately, and that is debate the Scottish Government's programme for government. And I've only mentioned a few of the pieces of legislation there. It's bursting at the seams with ideas, but most people in this chamber have sought to make party political points rather than engage with it. I hope that Yabu politics disappears quite quickly and we actually have a cross-party consensus in improving these bills and getting them on the statute books because it is ambitious for Scotland and that's what this parliament should be all about. Thank you very much, Mr Doris. I call Richard Lyle, the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. Can I, I want to begin by associating myself with comments made by my SNP colleagues over the last few days and sharing in the sentiments that this is a programme for government that is ambitious, filled with ideas and a passion to deliver for all the people of Scotland. Moving on to my remarks today, I want to focus on a number of key areas. There are so many bills, but I want to focus on some key areas, including looking into my subject of the week, which is GERS. Reflecting on the impact of Brexit on our economy, the impact of planning on our desires for economic growth, all flaming, framing, of course, my two main points, which is the record of achievement on the economy and indeed our future plans to deliver for Scotland. Presiding officer, this SNP Scottish Government has a record to be proud of in the economy from the establishment of highly competitive business rates regime, extending the number of business premises that pay no business rates through the Small Business Bonus Scheme to 100,000, cutting the business rate poundage by 3.7% for all business properties in our action supporting Scotland's trade, exports and international connections. Indeed, this SNP Government has presided over the Scottish economy, experiencing its longest period of un un uh, interrupted growth since 2001. I'm sure many members will have gathered by now. I'm rather sceptical on the accuracy of the findings of the GERS report, particularly in light of the answers received by the Cabinet Secretary in response to a question I posed yesterday. We have to remember there are more items involved in the country's economic standing. I'm sure that um, there are some who will disagree with me, and I've just heard some of them trying to disagree with me there, particularly those who want to continue to talk Scotland down. I believe a review of JERS would be a welcome step forward, a view which is supported by others out with this chamber. Over 50 years ago, I remember the UK Labour government was bankrupt, having to go to the IMF for a bailout loan, also the concern of severe balance of payments that the UK had under both parties. Funny how no one wants to talk about that, no, I have no time to talk about balance of payments nowadays or the trillion of pounds deficit that the UK Parliament now has. 
Making progress, pro progress on my remarks, I want to reflect on the independent review of the planning system. Planning stimulates the economy. This planning bill will ensure a greater focus on delivering the development Scotland needs with our infrastructure to support it. We must be proactive in bringing investment to Scotland and to our many areas which will benefit from economic upturn that projects will bring. Whether it is large-scale build building projects or housing development, we have to ensure that we meet the timescales which meets the needs of local people and developers. I agree with the desire to set out a clear view on how areas, areas will develop in the future. If others critical of the previous process if others are critical of the previous process, then they have to support the intention to speed up the planning process. I did note that one member has highlighted the delay in planning applications, and I agree that this must be looked at. Yes, planning has to take into account Greenbelt, but if we want to speed up planning and build up and build new towns, as some have suggested, then this review should go a long way to supporting those aims. We need a planning system that is streamlined Pramatic supports innovation and development and encourages the growth of our communities and our industries, which of course grows our economy. We have to work with local communities, businesses and entrepreneurs to provide economic growth. If we don't allocate the land, the green belt, to build on, then where will we get the new towns, the houses or the jobs for our population? That's why I believe this bill announced in the programme for government will build on the recommendations of an independent review carried out by a panel of experts last year, and it will help towards supporting economic growth, the delivery of houses and increased community involvement in planning decisions. I'm, I'm proud of this SNP government. I'm proud it's getting on with the day job, but it's also because it's delivering the type of forward thinking and space for innovation that our nation will thrive from. This programme for government outlined by our First Minister sets our nation on a trajectory over the coming years, a trajectory that shapes and paths our way to a fairer and more prosperous future for Scotland and its people. But it should be remembered that it's set against the backdrop of Brexit and the increasing reckless approach that this so customary of the Conservative UK government. Indeed, while our government acts with innovation, ambition and future thinking to grow our country and our economy, the UK government have found out, are found out for having no plan for Brexit, associated negative impact on economic growth. We now see the pound to euro rate slumping, the pound nearly on par with the euro. Over the last year, there has been a massive devaluation of the pound against both the euro and the dollar. Brexit paints a bleak image. So much that some in this place want another Brexit referendum. Well, I say good luck to them in this regard. But there is hope, and I believe that ultimately our programme for government shines bright. Hope, ambition and desire to improve the life chances of everyday Scots. Beyond the economy, we will deliver a national investment bank to support growth to our investment in delivering innovative low-carbon energy solutions or the lifting of the public uh, sector pay cap. The people who keep Scotland running are the public sector workforce. Our plans for education, justice and environment in finishing, the message from the debates over the last few days is clear, presiding officer. This is a programme for government put forward by our First Minister, indeed this SNP government in its 10th year in government. It's one which delivers, delivers for the people and delivers for Scotland. Thank you very much. Before I move to closing speeches, can I thank the members who have taken heed and turned up, though we have a rather substantial list of those who took part in the debate over three days who are not in the chamber and their names have been taken down and punishment will be, uh, we'll decide which punishment we'll have in due course. I have a range of them at my, I have to have some fun. Uh, I now call on Alec Cole, I now call Alec Cole Hamilton to close for the Liberal Democrats. Seven minutes or thereabouts, Mr Cole. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the top of this debate on Tuesday, the First Minister rose to deliver the intent of her programme for government. She travelled some well-trodden paths of self-congratulation, but there were some measures in which she has heeded the calls of other parties that I want to recognise and for which she should receive justifiable praise. For the news that we shall soon pass Scotland's own Turing's law and with it pardon those wrongfully criminalised for their sexuality. In her government's willingness to extend the presumption against prison sentences of less than 12 months, whilst finally increasing the age of criminal 
criminal responsibility to 12. Yeah, yeah. And for Scotland's children, in her commitment to meaningfully consider the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, whilst not standing in the way of John Finney's efforts to end the physical punishment of children in Scotland. For these in particular, I offer the thanks of these benches. Yeah, yeah. But for each of these shifts, significant as they may be, this debate has seen the inadequacies of her government and the inertia that now grips it laid bare. In education, where efforts to stop our slide down international rankings consist of the unwanted centralization of school governance. In the continuing shambles around CAP farm payments and its impact on the rural uh, economy, which as my colleague Mike Rumbles was right to point out, received not one line in the first minister's statement. And in a health service, missing targets and desperately short of staff in nearly every discipline. It is there, if you'll permit me, presiding officer, where I shall focus the remainder of my remarks. For there is no higher test of government than the provisions it makes for the needs of its citizens when they fall ill. We are, all of us, dependent on the NHS from our first day to our last. As such, its stewardship is the alpha and the omega of public service delivery. Over the summer, however, we have seen the true metal of the government's efforts in this agenda, and they have been found wanting. For yet another cycle of parliamentary business, the, the rhetoric of this chamber to put mental health on a parity with physical health has not been matched by action. The excoriating reception of the delayed mental health strategy has been underscored by the equally pressing reality that there is still no replacement for the suicide strategy which <coughs> expired in December. And yet this summer we learn of an 8% increase in people taking their own lives in this country. In child and adolescent mental health, we, are, we still see young people like my constituent, Dan McGregor, forced to wait nearly a year for treatment. That alone is a national outrage. And yet the number of children under 18 being prescribed <laughs> antidepressants has doubled since 2010 because of an insufficient provision of talking therapies. In workforce planning, we have GP surgeries in our nation's capital closing shop for want of partners, while half of all nurses told the Royal College of Nursing that staffing shortages led to patient care being compromised on the last shift they did. The Safe Staffing Bill, this government's response to that crisis, has been criticised already by the sector for only pay paying lip service to patient care. It will do nothing more than enshrine workforce planning tools in law, and these Tools, presiding officer, are already mandatory, and yet they fail to deliver the staffing levels and skills mix required to meet the needs of patients. The failings of the government's drug strategy can be measured out from cradle to grave. In the past three years, more than 700 babies were born with neonatal abstinence syndrome and require immediate rehab. While we learned in August that nearly 900 people died in drug-related circumstances last year, something described by Scottish Drugs Forum Chief Executive David Liddell as a national tragedy that requires a fundamental rethink to our approach. Put simply, presiding officer, that statistic sets us apart as the worst performing country in terms of drug-related mortality in the whole of the European Union. Ask any expert and they will tell you that there is a causal relationship between this government's 23% cut to drug and alcohol service, uh, services and this tragic human cost. This is an index of shame for this government. But it would be all too easy for me as an opposition member to simply point out where standards are falling and this government's inadequacies of command. So as we move forward into this year, I will provide an offer some radical and constructive solutions, like a doubling of child and adolescent mental health service funding and a talking therapist in every GP surgery. A penny on income tax for education to restore funding to, much needed, uh, to our nurseries, to our schools and our college places and the immediate restoration of funding to our drug and alcohol partnerships. At the end of her speech, the First Minister described the kind of Scotland that she wants to build. Now, I don't think that there's a soul in this chamber who doubts her integrity or doesn't share much of that same ambition. But we'll never be the best place to grow up. If our kids can get a better education south of the border, 
or while kids also in crisis can wait up to two years for mental health treatment. We'll never be the best place in the, uh, to be cared for when we fall ill. If you can't get a doctor's appointment, you have to wait hundreds upon hundreds of days for hospital discharge. And we'll never be the best place to grow old while our senior citizens can't access the care packages they need to live independently. Presiding officer, this debate traditionally sets the tone for the year ahead. So in the spirit of consensus, I want to finish by reiterating our thanks to the government for heeding the calls of my party and of others in the areas I have described. And I reach out to them in all sincerity in the hope that we can work together so that they might take responsibility for the failures identified, but also to listen to the plurality of solutions that come from other benches in this chamber. Thank you. Well, well well Thank you, Mr. Cole Hampton. I call John Finney to close with independence. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr. Okay. Finney. The, the Greens, I beg your pardon, I beg. <laughs> Hush of my soul. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Historically correct, but wrong yes. now. Cheers. Um, Thank you, President Officer. I welcome many of the announcements in the, the programme for government. For instance, we're very pleased about the public sector pay cap that it's to be scrapped. But I think we need to realise there's uh, expectations that will require to be managed here. Then there's a requirement to deliver in years of lost income for uh, valued public servants. And part of the discussion we need to have about is the discussion on tax powers. And certainly count the Scottish Green Party in on that. Two years ago, we proposed using new, the new tax powers to cut income for people in lower than average incomes and to raise income tax for people on higher than average incomes. It's more aggressive than others proposing across the board rises, but it is entirely about making Scotland fairer, raising funds for high quality public services, and we'll be happy to engage with others uh, on the issue. But one plea, please, let's be creative with these powers. Rather than tweaks to a system inherited from the UK government, um, la last year we got the Scottish government to cancel a, a, cut, a tax cut for higher earners. Let's see if we can go further this time, uh, much further, please. It's been suggested this is the greenest budget ever, and I think time will tell that in the interim the Scottish Green Party will scrutinise. We recognise we've no monopoly on environmental issues and welcome the growing consensus that the challenges placed by this planet are significant and will require collaborative working. Many of the announcements have the potential to mitigate climate change, but as ever, the devil is in the detail. The finances that's delivered behind each of these announcements, the policies that are developed in relation to the, the announcements, the way in which different policies interact and the overall direction of travel, the review and assessment that's made of these policies. So taking some of these individually, phasing out the new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2032, that's to be welcomed, including making uh, the A9 Scotland's first fully electric enabled road. Well, if that's the plan, let's start at the north and head south for once. <laughs> Thurso South, please. It's a good ambition, but given that many of the manufacturers are, are, are stopping making uh, petrol and diesel engines, wasn't this going to happen anyway? And shifting to electric cars can help reduce air pollution and climate change emissions, but they won't tackle congestion. Investments in our railways, buses and bike lanes will tackle congestion. So in the programme it says, the A9 electric superhighway also sends a very important signal on the future of motorised transport in Scotland. It certainly does. It sends a signal that the motor car is still king. Um, so although there was a similar push to electrify the railway that runs alongside the A9, the Scottish Government had an aspiration to electrify all the lines between Scottish cities by 2030. Now next year we're going to see the, high, uh, the, the, the Highland Main Line have the refurbished high speed trains. Um, and I spoke to a, a, a rail expert about that and asked about it and he described them as diesel guzzlers. Now, that's, this surely can't have a situation where we're beyond uh, 2030, and that's still the case. They would be over 50 years old. On the question of Arctic travel, of course, we welcome the doubling to 80 uh, million uh, from 2018-19, uh, but that, of course, reflects a previous underinvestment. And you compare that to the 150 million annual subsidy that the Scottish Government plans giving to the most polluting form of transport by cutting air departure tax. A cut for aviation will increase inequalities and that's entirely inconsistent with the Scottish Government's commitment to social equality. Avio aviation is disproportionately used by higher income groups, 70% of all flights in the UK taken by the wealthiest 15% of the population. Of course in contrast lower income people disproportionately depend on buses, walking and cycling and uh, the recent Scottish budget saw uh, spending frozen on these particular modes of transport. So, um, 
put into perspective that £150 million, that's nearly three times the total support for buses through the bus service <coughs> operators can add. Now, welcome the bus fund, welcome the extension um, that takes place, but it's quite apparent that the Scottish Government have low expectation for buses. Indeed, uh, the Transport Minister at one of our committee meetings said, our own survey data shows that the proportion of bus journeys undertaken in rural areas is significantly lower than that of urban areas. As such, currently in rural areas, there can be limited capacity for mode shift to bus. Now, there's no reason to believe that this is, in fact, a limiting factor in modal shift. Rather, it's a recognition of the shortcomings in the quality of transport in semi and rural uh, areas. So it, 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 it would, that is the position the Scottish Government had, that they didn't envisage growth in bus, and I hope that this signals a change to that. In relation to the Innovation Fund, very welcome that £60 million pounds to deliver the, the wider low-carbon car energy infrastructure solutions for Scotland. Um, um, it's going to, to take a lot, of, uh, a lot of energy, of course, um, in every respect to deliver on that. And we have the, the planning bill coming up, and that's something that the Green Party maintain a very keen interest on. And uh, um, there are opportunities there to reflect some of the policy announcements in the decisions that are taken in relation to that. Turning to the ScotRail franchise and the contract, well, we welcome the cross-party engagement. Um, the Scottish Green Party is unequivocal. We want to see rail nationalised. That's not presently what's possible. And we like, uh, we want like to see it acting like our ferries, serving our communities and not shareholders. Low emission zones, four largest cities, very welcome. And uh, maybe example of green pressure bearing fruit there. Uh, Mark Ruskell, my colleague, led a debate in this earlier this year and has raised questions at FMQs. And of course, we welcome the creation of four zones in the cities, but there's 38 pollution hotspots across Scotland in a number of areas, including my hometown of Inverness. So uh, there must be consultation. Um, um, uh, the, the consultation that's going on, the Scottish Government must, must consider the funding options for that and must jointly fund with the local authorities. In the short time I've left, good, the advisory group on reducing waste, um, good, the possible levy on uh, coffee cups, deposit return. What's missing? from a, a government that allowed dogs to be mutilated. It could offset that, have, have upset that shameful episode by having a complete ban on fox hunting, uh, CCTV and abattoirs. Um, human rights, the advisory group, that's very welcome. On the education, it's, it's unacceptable, the, the position we're here. One of the plans is to, uh, uh, in addition to a reform of school governance, will include a comprehensive review of how local decisions are made and how local democracy is working. Education is a huge part of local government, and if you proceed as planned, then local democracy won't be working, and I would ask the government to listen to the range of voices on that. Finally, of course, welcome the care for the under-65 with degenerative uh, illnesses, and I hope, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that the Westminster will not claw back the benefits. Um, presumption against 12-month sentences, very positive. But colleagues in the Conservative benches would do well to understand the intention of it and the autonomy of sentencing judges. Sent sheriffs must have confidence, of course, in alternatives to custody, and the £20 million for drug and alcohol services does uh, have Please to take into account the monies that have been lost. Thank you for the, the equal protection support. Hope you do the same for my colleague Mark Russell's 20 um, mile an hour bill. Thank you. And my apologies again to the Green Party. A lapse. I call James Kelly to close for Labour. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I welcome the opportunity uh, to close this programme for government debate on behalf of Scottish Labour. It has been a bit of a, uh, an up-and-down atmosphere over the last three days. Perhaps people are still getting over their summer holidays. I think in terms of the SNP's summer holidays, it doesn't need a postcard to know where they've been. They've been on a fishing expedition, <laughs> uh, looking through the manifestos of the other parties in order to pinch some ideas for the programme for government. So we welcome the fact that the pay cap is going to be ended uh, after the SNP had voted against that. Uh, we welcome the fact there's going to be an organ donation bill, something piloted by uh, Anne McTaggart in the last parliament. We welcome the fact there's going to be progress on free access to sanitary pro uh, products in universities and colleges and schools, something brought to the fore by my colleague Monica Lennon, particularly in her publication of her proposal for our private members bill. So we welcome all these uh, initiatives. However, the, the programme for government 
has been characterised by a real lack of ambition and particularly uh, a lack of ability to demonstrate to demonstrate that you want to use the new powers, Mr Swinney, that have been handed down to you. What an absolute, what an absolute scandal in modern Scotland that we have 260,000 children uh, on, in poverty. It's risen 70,000 in the last five years under the SNP watch. And although the 10 million fund is welcome, it's simply not good enough to address the scale of the problem, particularly when you've had more pearls passed on to you. We had 40 minutes from the First Minister and we heard about the rehashed education reforms, but we didn't hear about the anxieties of parents and teachers. We've had to look at the school system with 4,000 less teachers and 1,000 less support staff and watching standards begin to plummet as a result uh, of those lack of investment and resources from this SNP government. On housing, of course, we welcome the, the action on rough sleepers, but you just get the impression that the, that the, the government do not really realise the scale of the crisis in the housing. There's an element of complacency there. Not surprising when you saw that they didn't, they, they underspent the housing budget by 20 million pounds last year, despite, despite the fact, despite the fact, this, not, not at the minute, Mr. McMillan, uh, this, despite the fact that there are many, many thousands uh, on the waiting list for housing. I think the other thing that characterised the, the debate on housing was the contribution uh, from the Scottish Conservatives. Of course, uh, this is a new big idea and we heard uh, from Ruth Davidson and Adam Tompkins. But I must say, it really, it really galled to hear those speeches when you think that the Tories ran down the housing stock in the 80s and 90s, coupled by savage cuts to local government funding, which then didn't allow those local councils to, to replenish any of that stock. And then when they returned to power in 2010, they pursued a welfare programme that drove, unfortunately, too many people onto the streets to, to sleep rough. So when it comes to housing, those, those words come with a complete lack of credibility. Now, yeah, Mr McMillan. Stuart McMillan. I thank uh, James Kelly for taking the intervention. Mr Kelly mentioned there about, the, about welfare. Uh, can Mr Kelly then apologise to this chamber for his colleagues in the Labour Party when they voted for further austerity measures with the Conservatives uh, in, in the House of Commons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. James Kelly. Uh, perhaps Mr McMillan should apologise to the people of Inverclyde for voting through a budget that cut £160 million from council services. Now, we heard, we heard from many um, SNP backbenchers uh, during the course of the debate. Um, you know, they seem to gloss over the reality of what's happening in Scotland. Um, you can perhaps excuse some of the younger members. You know, rumours of a reshuffle continue to abound. And obviously, they wanted to play... I don't think, I don't think this is your strongest line of argument. They wanted to play... They wanted to play into the First Minister's good books. So the programme, the programme busting with ambition really meant, please, First Minister, can you give me a job? And then we heard... And then we heard... But you can't excuse... You can't excuse... You can't excuse the more senior members uh, of the SNP benches. We heard a speech from Stuart Stevenson uh, trumpeting how the SNP had such a great record on climate change, but he failed to mention the fact that in relation to the air departure tax, the government plans to uh, reduce uh, that by 50%, not only taking 
£189 million pounds out of the budget, but also uh, undermining the government's target to reduce carbon emissions. And then we heard, no, I won't, I'm running out of time. The, if you wish. Then we heard, uh, no, I want, I, want to get on to, I want to get on to Keith Brown, who seemed to completely ignore. He seemed completely oblivious to the low pay nature of the economy. As Alec Rowley said, there are 71,000 zero hour contracts and there are 466,000 people still not being paid the living wage in Scotland, two thirds of whom are women. So that's an absolute, that's an absolute scandal. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm actually beyond my time and I would take the intervention. The real test going forward for the SNP government is going to be the budget bill, because we'll then see whether they're prepared to put their money where their mouth is and whether they're prepared to back up the, the warm words in the programme with actual, actual action, which not only scraps the pay cap, but preserves jobs and services and addresses the actions that are needed in Scotland's communities. Thank you. I call Murdo Fraser to close to the Conservatives. Nine minutes or thereabouts, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. This has been a, a long debate to wind up, but I will do my best in the time available to me. Can I start, Presiding Officer, by echoing the comments made by a number of colleagues across the Chamber in paying tribute to Kezia Dugdale. Being leader of a political party is a great responsibility, and Kezia Dugdale served her party with great vigour and commitment, and I'm sure we all wish her well in the future. We now have, of course, what has become an almost annual fixture in the parliamentary calendar, the race to be the next Labour Party leader. And I think it's quite remarkable, presiding officer, that out of the 23 current Labour MSPs, no fewer than nine of them, nine, have either been leader, deputy leader, acting leader, or a candidate for one of those positions. That's 40% of the entire Labour leadership in this chamber. Such a lot of leadership, presiding officer, but so little to show for it. Of course, I'll give way. Jackie Bailey. I wonder whether the member would care to reflect on how many times he's tried but failed. Murdo Fraser. Only, only the once, Miss Bailey, but we, we, we stand in awe why you yourself would not put your name forward. You would be the people's choice to lead the Labour Party. But can I say to Jackie Bailey and to the 14 Labour MSPs who have not yet stood for leadership, don't worry, your turn will come along soon enough. <laughs> Presiding officer, these uh, three days of debate have been about the Scottish Government's programme for the coming year. And as my colleagues have pointed out over the last three days, there are aspects of this programme that we both support. We welcome the easing of the public sector pay gap, although we await hearing the detail of what is proposed. We welcome aspects of education reform, bringing in conservative ideas that my colleague Liz Smith has talked about for years, about empowering head teachers and greater parental involvement. And we welcome plans to implement Frank's law, which my colleague Miles Briggs campaigned for for so long, alongside many others, to extend dementia care to those below retirement age. But in too many other areas, this is a programme that either has the wrong priorities or simply fails to meet expectations. Let's take what was being said about the economy, which the First Minister was indicating earlier in the summer would be a priority for the Scottish Government. On the very day that she stood up to read out her programme for government, we learned that Scotland had slipped in the UK's prosperity rankings and now stands at ninth place among UK nations and regions compared to seventh in 2015. According to Barclays Wealth and Investments, only Wales, Yorkshire and Humber and the northeast of England have poorer performing economies than Scotland. And today, Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank published their SME health check, showing that the health of SMEs across the UK is at its highest level for 18 months. That's very good news, but Scotland lags behind the UK average. So the need for action on the economy is greater than it has been at any point before. And yet, rather than bold action, what we see is a mishmash of proposals, re-announcement of ideas already in train, and a rehash 
of old ideas. One of the centrepieces of the government's programme is the creation of a Scottish National Investment Bank. Now, in welcoming this on Tuesday, Ruth Davidson said that uh, this had been first announced in May 2013. Ms Davidson was being generous to the SNP government, uncharacteristically generous, <laughs> if I may say, because I actually checked, and when I checked back that fine newspaper, The Courier, I read this report. The Scottish Government has earmarked £150 million to establish a Scottish investment bank, First Minister Alex Salmond said yesterday at the STUC conference. That's a report presiding officer not from 2013, but from the 22nd of April 2009. Eight years ago, presiding officer, eight years later, it's finally being taken forward. And I hope that progress is faster than on some other much vaunted Scottish Government initiatives. Last year at this time, the First Minister announced the creation of a Scottish Growth Fund, a £500 million boost to Scottish business, half a billion pounds to be invested in the Scottish economy. And here we are, 12 months later, how much has been paid out of those half a billion pounds, not one penny to support the Scottish economy. This is a government that must do better. And they've also told us that they will take forward the recommendations of the Barclay Review, and we'll be hearing more about this from the Finance Secretary next week. But isn't it interesting that out of the headline proposals from the Barclay Review, two of them, in relation to reducing the level of the large business supplement back to the UK rate and reintroducing a tax break for new premises which lie empty are simply reverting the policy choices made by the previous finance secretary, which have now been shown to be serious errors. This is an SNP government having to spend their time mopping up their previous mistakes. <laughs> Resigning officer, where is the money to be raised from to pay for this? If the Scottish Government follows the Barclay Review recommendations, it will come from charging charitable bodies who currently provide sports and leisure facilities. So sports clubs, local authority swimming pools, leisure centres and gyms will all be hit with rates bills, meaning they will have to put up their charges for those who want to swim or exercise. How this squares with Scottish Government policy about encouraging more active lifestyles and tackling obesity is lost on me. And rather than address these concerns, presiding officer, what we were treated to yesterday from the Economy Secretary was a bizarre rant in which he claimed, in a speech laden with errors, that no one in the Conservative Party had acknowledged the opening of the Queen's Ferry Crossing. Now, I don't know where he was on Monday, but he must have missed all the pictures and comments from all of us who were privileged to be there uh, at the opening uh, of uh, the crossing. He must not have been listening to my colleague Jackson Carlow's speech on Tuesday, where I think for three minutes he talked about the Queen's Ferry Crossing and his own contribution to that process as the chair of the Parliamentary Committee. Because, presiding officer, they only hear what they want to. And the Queen's Ferry Crossing was not the only engineering marvel from Fife, Fife this summer. Because there was, of course, in addition to the Queen's Ferry Crossing, the magnificent new aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth. Where was the Scottish Government press release? Where were the tweets? Where were the selfies taken with the workers at Recife or Ungoverned? Not a peep could be held from the Scottish Government. And the First Minister only acknowledged the aircraft carrier when I shamed her into it at First Minister's questions before the recess. That is the difference, presiding officer, between the Scottish Government and the Conservative opposition, because we on these benches celebrate all Scottish successes. On the government benches, they only celebrate those that are stamped with the letters SNP. Yeah. Presiding officer, rather than me judge the SNP's programme in the economy, let's look at what businesses themselves are saying. Both the Scottish Retail Consortium and the Federation of Small Business have raised concerns about what is being proposed on a deposit return scheme, saying it lacks a detailed impact assessment on business. They are concerned about progress on provision of superfast broadband, but their greatest concern is around what is proposed from income tax, where there's a clear hint from the First Minister that the SNP are about to create even greater tax differentials between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Nothing could be more damaging to growing our economy by making Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. To sum up, presiding officer, there are aspects of this programme we can support. But too much of it is simply focusing on the wrong priorities. Whether it is stopping sending serious offenders to jail, as Liam Kerr said, whether it is hiking taxes, or whether it is dragging their feet on economic reforms, this is an SNP government heading in the wrong 
direction. They may think that this programme for government is a relaunch that sets them on the right track. But even nationalist commentators are not convinced by this government's record. Writing recently in The Guardian, the commentator Kevin McKenna, a supporter of Scottish independence, said this of the SNP government, and I quote, on health, education, taxation, and on its attitude to Scotland's hard-pressed SME sector, the SNP had 10 years underpinned by large majorities to reverse generations of decline. They opted instead for an easy life. When they could have been bold, they blew it. Residing officer, if that is the judgment of nationalist commentators, they can hardly expect us, or indeed the Scottish people, to be more generous in our support. They are a government which must do better. Thank you. I call on Michael Matheson to close for the government. Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And um, I must confess that in listening to Muddle Fraser in his closing remarks, uh, starting off with talking about electoral success is not a strong hand for Mr Fraser. Looking at my colleague John Swinney, he is a mantelpiece where he has more Muddle Frasers on it than he knows what to do with, <laughs> given your electoral pedigree. So I don't think you're in the best place to give anyone anyone at all advice on how they, they should succeed in elections. <laughs> Sign officer, on Tuesday the First Minister set out a bold and ambitious programme for government. It's a programme which recognises the significant achievements that we have achieved over the last 10 years and which is ambitious for the future of our nation. It's a programme which recognises Scotland's place as an outward focused global contributor committed to human rights and to protecting the very environment which we cherish and which we live in. But creating that inclusive, fair and prosperous society also requires our public sector organisations to play their part in delivering a more socially just Scotland. And in a debate this afternoon with a focus on public services, that's at the very heart of what we want to achieve with this programme for government. During the course of the debate, when my colleague Shona Robinson opened the debate, she highlighted some of the challenges which we face within our NHS, and there can be no part of our public sector that struggles more with having to face up to the changing nature of our society. Will that be the changes in demographic, which we're all aware of, alongside with the advances in medicine and in treatment, the way in which we need to change the way in which we deliver NHS healthcare in the future. And as Claire Hockey highlighted in her contribution, focusing on our NHS, that's not just about structural reform. That's not just about simply renaming services in one way or another. It's about fundamentally changing the way in which our NHS and our health services are delivered. And a key part of what we have taken forward as a government has been the integration of health and social care. People talk about the integration of health and social care now and dismiss it as though it's taken as granted. For anyone, anyone who's worked within the NHS or within social care will know that the integration of health and social care has been the holy grail of trying to make sure that we deliver more effective services to the people of Scotland and across the rest of the UK. We can see, for example, in England and Wales, the way in which they continue to struggle to deliver integrated health and social care, largely undermined by the ever-creeping privatisation of the NHS in England and Wales. But the reality is that we have made major strides in how we integrate our health and social care system here in Scotland, ones which will actually deliver real change in the way in which services are delivered to the people who require them. That's an example of reforming and changing the way in which we deliver our health and social care system. And as someone who worked in that sector, I know exactly the difference it's making and how services are being developed today. The presiding officer, the First Minister also, in her statement on Tuesday, set out our ambitious plans for our education system here in Scotland, strengthening our education system by closing the timing gap and also setting out radical reforms for education governance, giving head teachers new powers and responsibilities, and importantly, strengthening the voices of teachers, children, and parents at the very heart 
of our education system. But, President Officer, a number of members in the course of the debate today in talking about public services made reference to social security, and in particular, the creation of the new social security agency here in Scotland. Then, officer, our social security agency will work very differently from the callous approach yeah. of the Conservative government at Westminster. We'll have a social security agency which is based on fairness, dignity and respect, all three of which are missing from the welfare system in England yeah. being run by the UK government. <laughs> and to set out our ambitions compared to that of the UK government in making sure that it's got fairness and dignity and respect at its heart, the first benefit that will be paid from it will be for carers allowance, supporting carers to make sure that they can continue to make the important contrib contribution they make to our society. And to build on that, the first new benefit that it will pay will be the Best Start grant, helping to support mothers and babies at the very key point when they need some financial support. That sets out our ambition to have a better welfare system here in Scotland and one which we will ensure delivers dignity to those ha who have to make use of it. But can I also say, can I finish this point first of all and I give way to Mr Rumbles. Can I also say it is, it is difficult to accept or to listen to anybody on the Conservative benches to talk about rough sleepers without acknowledging the callous actions of your own government in London yeah. and the damage that it's causing to individuals and communities through the cuts to welfare provision within our society. No MSP. <laughs> there can be no MSP in this chamber that hasn't had a constituent in tears That's at the way in which they've been treated by the welfare system that's created by, been created by the UK government. And let's not just dismiss the UN report that talks about the humanitarian crisis that's been created by the changes which have been taking place within the UK welfare system. So when the Tories come here and start to lecture us about tackling rough sleepers, you should look at yourself in the mirror and recognise the damage that you're causing to people day in, day out by your callous actions in yeah. current welfare provision. <laughs> I'll give way to Mr Rumbles. Mike I Rumbles. I thank the Minister for, for giving way and he's raised some very important points which I, I agree with him. But when the First Minister in her opening statement said nothing at all about the rural economy and the problems facing the rural economy, especially with the farm business payments throughout rural Scotland, you have a few minutes at least to address that issue because there are a lot of people out there waiting for this issue to be addressed. Minister. Uh, Sign officer, if the member cares to look at the programme for government, there's a whole range of measures that we are taking forward in order to support our rural communities and our rural, rural economy. And we'll continue to take forward ambitious plans in order to make sure we support our rural communities and our rural economy. But can I turn to a couple of the justice issues, a couple of the justice issues, and the rather bizarre idea that the Conservative Party in some way are the ones who come up with the idea of drug driving tests. The reality is that the drug driving test was actually in the Independent North report, which the only part of the UK that's fully implementing it is Scotland in order to make sure our roads are actually safer. But I want to turn to the issue around the presumption against short sentences because listening to the Conservative Party at times on justice matters is like listening to someone reading out a Daily Mail editorial. The reality is that we know that short sentences, and the evidence shows this, not just domestically, internationally, short sentences are very ineffective at tackling offending behaviour. And what have we got in Scotland? We have got reoffending down to an 18 year low. Why is it down? It's down because we've been increasing the use of community disposals. And we want to build on that, use the evidence that demonstrates the real impact that it can have, because in doing that, you reduce the risk of someone committing further offences and you reduce the risk of someone being a victim of a crime as well. Exactly. But we've also listened to the views of victims. And that's why before we will even change the presumption against any short sentences. They will make sure that all provisions within the Domestic Abuse Bill, with the support of this Parliament, are implemented before there is any changes made to that. So, an officer, I'm limited in time, I'm afraid, and I want to make further progress. One other piece of legislation that was not mentioned, which I regret, particularly from Alex Cole, 
Hamilton, given his previous background, is a vulnerable witnesses and pre-recorded evidence bill. That will allow us to increase the provision of pre-recorded evidence. Why is that important? Because that gives us the opportunity to take children out of our court system. It allows us to make sure that we can fundamentally alter the experience that children who suffer from traumatic abuse and the way in which they engage with their justice system. I had the benefit last week to go to Iceland to see the Barnhus model in action. It is inspirational. We are determined to bring that to Scotland, to reform the way in which our justice system works for our children and our young people and vulnerable witnesses. And this legislation will help to support us in achieving that. Jane Officer, this is a government that has a strong track record over the last 10 years, fundamentally reforming our public sector, building on the progress that we've made through reforming our laws and in making sure we build a strong economy here in Scotland, but one which is committed to creating a socially just and a progressive Scotland. This, President Officer, is a programme for government which is ambitious, bold and will take this nation forward over the coming year. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes our debate on the Scottish Government's programme for government 2017-18 and there are no questions to be put at decision time. So I close this meeting of Parliament.